صباح الخير يا دكتور علاء صباح الخير معالي الوزير ازي حضرتك؟ ازي اخبارك ايه الحمد لله كله تمام يا فندم والله صباح الخير دكتور هشام صباح الخير صباح النور كيف الحال؟ ازي حضرتك عامل ايه تمام؟ الحمد لله تمام موفقين سعيدة موفقين مع الصباح كده ان شاء الله ان شاء الله ان شاء الله صباح الخير يا بروفيسور عادل طبعا نور ازيك يا دكتور مالي هشام بيه ازي حضرتك؟ الحمد لله تمام انا بخير الحمد لله تكون كده سعداء بوجودكم معانا في الكونفرنس الله يخليك يبارك فيك تسلم البركه في القائمين على انتم كلكم عملتوا جهد هايل ان شاء الله ما شاء الله الله يخليك الدكتور عادل دكتور هشام على المستوى الشخصي هو استاذي وهو لا احنا يا فندم هنهرب من الحياه ليه؟ آه. مش بكبر مش بكبرك ولا حاجه بس دي الحقيقه. آه. لا لا. <تصفيق> والدكتور عادل هو الريفرنس لنا يا دكتور هشام في مصر في الـ في البزنس اديوكيشن ان جنرال. دكتور م. عادل كان نائب رئيس جامعه القاهره وهو حاليا رئيس لجنه القطاع التجاري في المجلس الاعلى للجامعات المصريه فهو بالنسبه لنا البنش مارك في كل حاجه يعني. لا يا فندم ده ده شرف ليا يا دكتور علاء ان انا العفو العفو والله يا دكتور عادل العفو وارجو ان احنا يعني نضيف ولو حاجه بسيطه كده لل الله يكرمك ويديك الصحه يا دكتور الدكتور محمد سالم كلمني وهنبعت له اللينك هو عاوز يتفرج على المحاضره بتاعت حضرتك هنبعتها له فورا اه ماشي يا فندم ماشي يا فندم في اخبار الكورونا في في مصر لان هنا الاعداد عماله تتزايد وفي اللي هو بارشل لوك داون موجود في الوقت الحالي كمان. اه والله احنا عندنا الدنيا يعني اندر كنترول يعني احنا في الجامعه عندنا شغالين هايبريد مش بنيجي بقوه الطلبه كامله. م. لكن بيجيب اتليست 50% من الطلبه وبنعمل بريميتيشن وكومباينيشن تباديل كده. <تصفيق> لو حصل وبعض ال... احنا واخدين كل الاحتياطيات من اول دخول الطالب على البوابه في قياس حراره احنا عندنا مستشفى متكامله داخل الكامبس في اي حاجه المستشفى عندها اماكن للعزل لو حصل ظهر حاله والاسبوع اللي فات ظهر حالتين في فصلين مختلفين بنقفل الفصلين التو كلاسز 15 يوجوش وبنحول التعليم بتاعهم اونلاين اوكي <تصفيق> لكن حتى الان الاعداد واحنا دايما بنقيس يا دكتور هشام في مصر ممكن تبقى فيه الاعداد ساعات الناس بتشكك فيها شويه لكن احنا بنقيس بالمستشفيات يعني المستشفيات العزل ومستشفيات الطوارئ ومستشفيات الحالات الحرجه فاضيه احنا مثلا كانت علينا ايام كان كل واحد فينا يدور على وسط عشان يحجز مكان اوكي <تصفيق> حاليا فاضيه فمعنى انها فاضيه يعني يا الموضوع اندر كنترول يا يا الناس اللي بيجي له حاجه بيعمل عزل في البيت وبيتعامل وخلاص يعني. ايوه لا هنا الهاير اديوكيشن كله اونلاين اونلاين بيورلي انا عارف انا عارف أوه. احنا بس داخلين على رمضان بقى كل سنه وانتم طيبين فاخشى ان الاعداد تتزايد بقى انت عارف بقى ال... الالتحام في رمضان وال... والسهرات والعزومات وكده فربنا يستر يعني. الله الله يعين الله يعين الاعداد ما تتزايدش اكتر من كده يا رب اوكي ليت مي جاست سي مطلع ار يو كان يو هير مي؟ يس اي كان دكتور هشام رايت اي جيس ميبي وي كان ستارت بيكوز ذا تايمنج سو وي ار كونستريند باي هاف ان اور So I guess All we right. can start. Okay. 
Okay, we'll do. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon from wherever you're watching. Uh, welcome to the day two of the first Inter Business and Entrepreneurship International Conference organized by Modern College of Business and Science in Oman and College of International Transport and Logistics, Arab Academy for Science, Technology and Maritime Transport in Egypt. My name is Mutla Saoud al Saidi, and I'll be your presenter for today's sessions. I am so happy to say that we had a successful first day and we're extremely honored with the presence of the official sessions VIPs. His Excellency, Dr. Saeed Al Haddabi, the Under Secretary of Scientific Research and Innovation, Ministry of Higher Education, Research and Innovation in Sultanate of Rahman, and His Excellency, Professor Mahmoud Sekar, President of the Academy of Scientific Research and Technology in Egypt, and our keynote speakers, Dr. Mohammed Abdel Qadir Saddam, Professor Adel Mohammed Abdel Halim Zayed, Professor Zahar Irani, and Dr. Patrick A. Bennett. Today, we shall continue our day with several very useful and enlightening scientific paper presentations, which were chaired by the Arab Academy and MCBS qualified and distinguished faculty members. I'm excited to introduce to you our opening session chair for today, Dr. Hisham Megd, who is the Associate Dean and Quality Assurance and Accredi uh, Accreditation, Faculty of Business and Economics Head of Modern College of Business and Science in Masqat Amman. Dr. Hisham has been the driving force behind strategic institutional development during the time of profound change in the higher education in the Middle East. Additionally, he has a broad knowledge of the UK, USA, Middle East university systems, quality and accreditation systems, budget control, faculty development, and significant experience of university senior management and a public profile at senior academic level within the sector and also experience in practical business through his involvement with business ownership, startup and organization presidency board members and vice president position, president, uh, university president and vice chancellor and business college dean. He is highly committed to building student-centered and entrepreneurial mind with a focus on organizational excellence through learning and growth. And we also have today's uh, our keynote uh, address by Professor Adil. Professor Adil has a PhD from Wharton Business School, University of Pennsylvania, where he has specialized in organizational learning model for bureaucratic organizations, a strategic management perspective. He is currently a professor of business administration, faculty of commerce at Cairo University in Egypt. Professor Adil was a former Qalyubiya governor in Egypt and a former president at the University of Modern Sciences in Dubai, UAE, as well as a former president of the Commercial Studies Committee sector, um, Egyptian University Supreme Council, and former vice president for Education Students Affair in Cairo University. Without further ado, I will first hand the mic to Dr. Hisham, which then will introduce a few words on Professor Hag. Dr. Hisham, the mic is all yours. Thank you, Motla. Uh, a very good morning to each one of you. Uh, and welcome to Professor uh, Adel Muhammad Abdel Halim Zaid. We all been excited about his presentation. So we all are really waiting to hear from his distinguished experience, really, whether at the industrial level, whether at the education level, to really enhance the conference with his knowledge. So let me welcome Professor Adel and call him on the stage where he can start his presentation. Professor Adel, uh, you have 25 minutes, hopefully and then five minutes of question and answer. I know half an hour is not enough, but you know, we are confined with the conference limitation and I'm sure we can bring you on board at some other time to really enhance the whole knowledge experience and learning with more hours of your time. So please take it away. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Hisham. Thank you very much. And uh, before I start, let me uh, say a good word and I'm uh, very excited and uh, I see the conference is very uh, informative and uh, it's a good contribution to the academia in general and uh, for myself uh, in specific. And uh, I enjoyed yesterday's uh, sessions. And uh, let me thank look, all the organizers of the course and uh, the Dr. Ismail Abdul-Bafar uh, for this continuous support for the educational process uh, inside the academy and outside the academy and the Dr. Ala also the dynamo of the, the, the conference. Uh, he's a, a very good friend of mine and uh, he's very active. Dr. Hisham, I would like also to 
to thank you for the effort you have uh, exerted in, in this uh, uh, conference. And uh, uh, actually, and I will build on uh, what I have said yesterday, uh, Dr. Uh, Mohammed Salim uh, mentioned many of the aspects I'm going to cover. Uh, today, I will speak uh, specifically about the business education. But I think uh, whatever conclusions we can reach in this area, we can uh, um, use it in, in any other discipline. The education, after all, higher education, uh, uh, live in the same environment and uh, suffer the same uh, threats and uh, have the same opportunities. Uh, when I speak about the business education, this is my area of specialization, but generally speaking, we can uh, generalize some of these uh, conclusions or uh, results or, uh, on other uh, education disciplines. I, I will start, Taban, or I, I would like uh, for the second time to thank Dr. Mohamed uh, Salim for the insights he gives us, uh, uh, he gave us yesterday. And I, I will start uh, by the very famous quote of William Shakespeare, to be or not to be? To be or not to be? This is a question we are facing now in the business uh, education area. Either to be or to, to, to vanish. So uh, uh, I'm borrowed, I'm borrowed the, 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 this and uh, I'm talking about the future of uh, the business education. And uh, I selected the B business uh, and the education to, to be or not to be. So this is uh, the, the case I'm uh, presenting today. Uh, a very famous quote by uh, Mark Cowan. Uh, uh, he said the two most important days in your life are the uh, day you were born and the day uh, you find out why. Now we are uh, going through the second phase. The day we find out why do we exist as a business education. So I like this quote actually, it tells you that one of the two most questions in your life is to define your mission. We need to change. Why do we need to change? Why? Change as we all know is the only constant. And uh, uh, a very famous quote also goes uh, like, uh, you can't step into the same river twice. You cannot step into the same river twice. Actually, the business education cannot step into the same river twice. Students change, uh, educational uh, methodologies change, it, uh, everything changes. So we are not swimming in the same lake that we used to swim uh, 15 or 10 years ago. It's a new, totally new lake. So that's why we have to dig. Why do we need change? Is it is a is a business education expensive? No, never. Now we shouldn't look at the business education as a cost. Yeah, source of income, source of uh, achievement, source of uh, growth. But if we look at the business education as a cost, uh, uh, we are done. Try the ignorance. If you think education is expensive, try ignorance. Ignorance is uh, uh, much more costly. Uh, however, I'm quoting also Qatar, Philip Qatar, when he said the successful change efforts are messy and full of surprises. Right. Let us start by saying the challenge, the challenge uh, facing most of the current Egyptian business education school is to find ways to aggressively adapt to changing market trends. Yes. Had we said as Ilan? Okay, so. Uh, be, uh, become possible victim of continuous program A consolidation. Uh, the whole story of business education is adapt, uh, uh, being responsive to change. Being responsive to changes. As Charles Darwin said once, it's not the strongest of the species that survive, nor the most intelligent, but the one most responsive to change, adaptability. 
this is a question. See, uh, as you can see, I'm using lots of uh, quotations from others. It's very indicative that to, uh, to explain my idea. We are facing a huge amount of uh, uh, new trends and uh, challenges. Uh, and the question is, are we ready? Are we ready? Okay, fine. Uh, the, the business education, the, 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 the change in the, the, the education generally, and generally in the uh, higher education is uh, very fast, like a bullet train, 600 kilometers uh, per hour or more. And now we all know that uh, we have what we call uh, knowledge explosion, knowledge explosion. Knowledge explosion, the, the rate of uh, new uh, invest, uh, uh, ideas and uh, changes are very, very uh, high. It's, uh, it grows in an exponential. Uh, what, uh, whom we are serving now? Uh, actually, the business education has a unique market. We are serving the business markets with all the sub -biz uh, business markets in there. We are serving the not-for-profit organizations. We are serving the government. We are serving the financial uh, markets. So uh, it's uh, it's very normal to find business graduates everywhere, everywhere. Banks, real estate companies, uh, insurance companies, charity organizations, uh, uh, stock markets, government. Uh, that's why we, we, the change creates a gap between what we offer and what the market needs. It's, it's very important to, uh, to bridge the gap, bridge the gap between what the market expects and what do we offer, okay? So we have to uh, bridge the gap between the, uh, um, market requirements and graduates, our graduates specification. Uh, and uh, I, I can recall that Dr. Muhammad Salim yesterday mentioned that the skills will be totally different from yesterday's skills required for the market. So we are working in a very dynamic, uh, ever-changing environment. We feel, uh, I, if, if I can recall, we see a report from the World Economic Forum uh, 2018 mentioned many uh, skills that will be needed very soon by uh, 2022 uh, for the market. And they stated some uh, jobs that will be uh, diminished and uh, removed from the market. And, and some other uh, uh, jobs and skills that will be required uh, by the. Uh, how do we uh, uh, require? Uh, uh, yeah, and what are the criticisms that we are facing? Uh, these are five criticisms, but uh, this is not a comprehensive list. The, I, I selected only five. Uh, let's focus on developing soft skills, which is very important. And the uh, World Economic Forum emphasized uh, these soft skills, problem solving, uh, uh, data analytics, uh, uh, negotiation, interpersonal communications, and, and all this kind of stuff. Uh, number two, uh, both uh, need to put more emphasis on leadership, creativity, and the entrepreneurial uh, ship, uh, which is, was mentioned in the very, I'm always referring to my dear uh, colleague, Dr. Mohammed uh, Salim, and he emphasized the, these uh, skills Students need to develop a global perspective. Why? Um, our graduates actually are uh, competing in a very, very uh, broad markets. Uh, for instance, yeah, uh, Google company. Google company uh, are recruiting people from all over the world. Each year, they have more than 1 million candidates willing to work for Google. I don't think this is uh, designed only to pick some people from the Middle East or Europe or uh, Asia. Like in Oman, they, they are competing globally. That's why we have to consider uh, when we prepare our students 
we don't take only the national standards into uh, mind, but we have to take the international uh, uh, standards in mind. A traditional classroom delivery needs to be changed with more innovative changes techniques. And uh, in this area, I'm referring to what ha has been said yesterday about the virtual classes, uh, intellectual uh, capital, and all this stuff. Our focus should be on uh, knowledge, and we'll take, uh, and I will talk about that later on. Uh, a, a very interesting the statistics uh, uh, tell us that uh, when, when they ask people, uh, this is a global, uh, global university in viewability uh, in uh, 2016, when they asked people about uh, which of the following skills and experience are most predictive of graduates in viewability, which is very important. Uh, surprisingly, if you look at the bottom of the chart, you will, you will find uh, uh, an astonishing uh, result. Graduation from a top university. It does not count for accountability. What counts is professional experience, high degree specialization, proficiency in least two foreign languages, extracurricular activities, excellent academic record, and, and, and finally, at the very bottom, we have the graduation of, uh, from top universities. Uh, this message uh, is telling us that we have to uh, focus more in designing curriculums and delivering uh, studies to, to enhance the professional experiences needed by the market very interesting statistic I consider. Uh, uh, Maharaj Shudaevi. Sorry. Sorry, I'm sorry for, for interruption. Hi. Then, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, we have to bridge a gap between uh, market expectations and our uh, delivery style. style. When we talk about the future of the business education, I'm uh, proposing a, a new approach. I call it, uh, I call it uh, MQ, MQ. And this is my invention, actually. It's not in the literature. But uh, uh, this approach depends on three ends. Uh, number one, a meaning. Number two, measuring. Number three, uh, managing. So we are talking about three ends. I, I, I call them MQ. To, to, to start looking at the business education, we have to take into consideration three ends. Man meaning. Measuring, managing. What what what's meaning? The question is, uh, what's our business? What business we are in? Uh, generally speaking, and uh, I expect you to argue with me in this area. We are in the business of knowledge. We are the business of knowledge. We are the business of knowledge, and knowledge, as we all know. Knowledge is power. Knowledge is power. So I, I do think that uh, business education should, should focus on uh, uh, creating, disseminating, and using of knowledge. But to do this, we have to unlearn what we have been doing for a long time. So business education is centered about generating knowledge, research site, dissemination of knowledge, teaching publications, and the application of knowledge, which is a, which is a industry application for the science. This requires us to attract and maintain and develop talented professors, researchers, and the students. So the selection of the students 
the selection criteria should be reconsidered in, in, the, in the light of the new mission that we have. We are in business of creating knowledge. Okay. Uh, uh, majoring. Uh, it's uh, it's well known uh, everywhere that what what you cannot measure you cannot manage, or what gets measured gets managed. So it's very very important for us to measure the quality the quality of the uh, business education. Actually, I I I, uh, I see that in this area we 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 developed many approaches. Uh, to, to measure the quality of the business education. One of the most famous uh, measures that we can use is the uh, Baldridge National Award, uh, which depends on uh, seven uh, criteria, leadership, strategic planning, student uh, stakeholders and market focus, uh, workforce uh, focus, process management, and I'm not quite sure what they are saying. Mm. Okay. So the, 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 this model is very comprehensive uh, and it provides uh, uh, educational institutions with a very detailed process and many of the Arab uh, universities are seeking to get the accreditation of Malcolm Baldridge uh, National Award. Uh, I don't have enough time to go through each one of these uh, elements, but uh, I have the model. If you want to see it, I can provide it for you. Uh, now we come to the final issue, which is uh, managing the business education. So first we have to define what business and I'm suggesting that we are working in the knowledge industry. Uh, second one is uh, how to measure. Uh, I can see that we have many reliable uh, tools to measure the quality of the higher education. And finally, manage it. What, 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 as I mentioned before, Edmar, for the last time, uh, what gets measured gets managed. So, uh, we manage the value creation. Value creation. Our business is to uh, create value for the society, for all the stakeholders, actually, students, uh, suppliers, uh, the government. We deliver the right business education when we uh, increase the value creation. And uh, I, I'm suggesting, you know, uh, three levels uh, of management. The first one, I call it alpha level of management in the business education. Uh, this is a gradual incremental plan approaches to change the cumulate over a period of time, which focuses on changes uh, to particular uh, arenas within the business education. Uh, and this is reflected in uh, some of the minor modifications for the current, uh, current business programs. And uh, we always do this. We take a minor, minor changes in one of the areas, market, uh, finance, and so on. And the, the, the next higher level is uh, uh, beta. Beta uh, is gradual incremental emergent approach to change that developed over a period of time to cumulative and uh, comprehensive change. This is like adding a, a new program, a new program to the current program and a new area of specialization. Like uh, for instance, currently in Egypt, we have a trend to add uh, a specialization in uh, artificial intelligence. This is very famous. We added. So the, I consider this as a beta uh, level of management. The final level and the highest level is gamma level of management. And this is a radical change in the philosophy of the higher education in the business education. And then, as I mentioned before, I linked this to the beginning of the lecture. I said 
that we have to take into consideration that we are working in the knowledge industry and we have to consider the value creation. By this, I'm, so, I'm uh, closing my uh, presentation. I'm sorry, it was very fast. It was very uh, brief, but uh, I'm taking into consideration as Dr. Uh, Hisham B mentioned, uh, we have uh, time constraint. So thank you, Dr. Hisham, for the support and th thank you for the audience for being uh, patient with me. And uh, my is, is all yours. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Adel. This was really an eye opener. So now I'm just seeing if there's any question from the audience or the participant, but let me start with the first question anyway. So now we are talking about business education. What do you think the future of business education? Where are we going? How do we view business education in 20 years time? Okay, uh, this is a very excellent question, of course coming from a scholar like Dr. Ishamiyani. And uh, let me start by saying that the business education is a reflection of the society's needs, right? So uh, we are reflecting the, the market needs uh, in a sense that uh, you cannot serve someone who's uh, far away from you. I mean, they are very advanced and you are very late. Uh, I do expect that we have to do the opposite. We should lead the market, not to be led by the market. That is study, as you know, the Christian B, instead of some sort of cooperation with the business environment in any country, and they should be involved, and we should work together, develop curriculum to improve the quality of the students, to work on some uh, uh, skills needed in the market. لأن إحنا عندنا في مصر كده ساعات يقول لك إيه when you join the work for the first time يقول لك إنسى اللي تعملته في الجامعة I'm gonna teach you إيه the skills I need طبعا إحنا عايزين نلغي على العبارة دي يعني فممكن with joint work with the society actually I don't want to have the business in the business and the university separation I would imagine that we need business University integration. Yeah. Thank you. Great uh, answer. So now what I understand that we have to have a collaborative effort from the stakeholders, all of them, with our government, non-government, the private sector, the student, the parents, to come up with a very comprehensive business education. Uh, but, uh, yeah. other education. Yes, but now you have the private higher education and you have the government higher education. And again, the private sometimes perceive higher education in a different manner because they look after the, the financial side of it. So how do you get all those working together really to produce graduates that who really fit the market without looking at the financial side that closely or monitoring the ins and outs of all these matters? How do you get it really uh, focusing on the education for the sake of education rather than for the sake of profitability? Mm. Uh, uh, see, I, 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 can say, I, I can see no contradiction actually. And uh, as Dr. Muhammad Salim mentioned yesterday, the endowment in uh, he said Harvard uh, Business School, it, it, it reached like $25 billion. And uh, what we are seeking, uh, Dr. Hisham, is to define the uh, interaction uh, area or intersection area between the benefits of education and the benefits of the industry. Uh, and, and we have to work on that. Even sometimes you, you can uh, design special programs to serve as a specific, a specific industry. Uh, when now we are doing this in Cairo University, now we are doing a, a a special program for people in uh, taxation and uh, people in uh, customs. Uh, 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 come on, uh, as I mentioned uh, at the very beginning, Dr. Rajambi, uh, we shouldn't look at the education as a, a source of expense or cost. If you, if you take this stand, the ignorance is the cliff of the cliff. 
يعني واخد بال حضرتك انت لو عايز تضعف اي جهاز اداري في الدوله حط فيه انكومبتنت كيد فاحنا المهمه بتاعتي وانا بعتبر طبعا ام فيري ام بايزد عشان انا ام كامينج فروم ا بزنس باك جراوند بس انا لا اي كان سي ذات ان احنا فيري دينجرس ان انت تو ليت بيبول تيك اوفر ريسبونسبيلتي وايل ذي ار نوت ويل بريبيرد فور ذات I totally agree. Uh, I know that we are running out of time. It was a very interesting uh, discussion. I'm sure we can take this further at some other time, but now let me thank you very much for coming on board and give us your experience. And it was a great presentation. So thank you very much. And I'm sure we'll see you in the other upcoming sessions. So in that case, have a lovely day and thank you and bye-bye for now. Thank you. Thank you very much. يا دكتور محمد بيه يعني لا لا يخليك يا حبيبي لا بفضل ليك والله لا انا عمال لا
Good morning. Uh, can you hear me? I hope everyone uh, is doing well. Welcome to our first session uh, in the second day uh, for the first business and entrepreneurship conference. Um, I would like to start our uh, session uh, today uh, by welcoming everyone, asking the panelists, the presenters to open their cameras so that everyone can uh, see them and also uh, share. Uh, we have the first uh, speaker to uh, now to share their screen, to share her, her screen. Um, I'm, it's my pleasure today to be uh, chairing this session with three very interesting papers uh, in the field of uh, in the field of uh, marketing uh, and social uh, social media marketing uh, advertising and the consumer perceptions um, well uh, really the three papers are very interesting we have today uh, Application of text mining to analyze customer opinions on social media by uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Rulu Lin and uh, analyzing the effectiveness of advertisements in marketing commercial events by Dr. Hiba uh, Al Tuki and uh, the third paper investigating consumer perceptions on environmentally friendly cars in Oman, a study of hybrid electric cars uh, by uh, to be presented by Dr. Uh, Simoji Sudavan. I hope I pronounce correctly. Uh, I welcome uh, Dr. Uh, Rulu Lin, the first, our first speaker, our first presenter, uh, to present the paper called Application of Text Mining. Uh, actually, uh, it was my pleasure reading the paper. It's a very interesting paper, um, talking about a very important business factor today, which is mining, uh, data mining of, uh, of the customer opinions, um, which gives a very uh, good feedback on how important the customer uh, uh, comments are and the customer uh, opinions are on social media, which can really be helpful for businesses uh, to take the correct actions. Uh, so I would like to present Dr. Uh, Rolu. Uh, Dr. Rulo is an assistant professor and the final year project coordinator of the Faculty of Computing Sciences at Gulf College in academic affiliation with uh, Staffordshire University, UK. Uh, she is a certified uh, SAP lecturer, licensed professional uh, teacher, research reviewer, research consultant, book writer, and computer science professor who taught in higher education institutions in Philippines, Kingdom of Bahrain and uh, Sultanate of Oman. Uh, she has uh, two decades of administrative and teaching experience in the academic uh, field and held various positions such as, such as associate dean, department head, alumni head, and career uh, guidance coordinator. I welcome you, Dr. Rulu. Uh, please share your screen and start your presentation. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I hope you can see my screen. Yes, we can. Okay, that's great. Um, for a while. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so um, good morning, uh, everyone. Um, good morning to all of you. I would like to welcome you all to my presentation. Uh, thank you for a brief introduction about myself. Uh, again, I am Dr. Rololin Rodriguez Maata, currently an assistant professor uh, from Faculty of Computing Sciences at Gulf College Muscat in Oman. 
Uh, today, I will present and share with you our research study, the entitled, uh, entitled Application of Text Mining to Analyze Customer Opinions on Social Media. So before uh, I start my presentation, so I would like to uh, extend my great, uh, my, my sincerest gratitude to my co-authors, uh, Dr. Uh, Aaron Paul Pineda uh, from Higher College of Technology in UAE, Dr. Ferdinand Epoch from uh, University of Bahraini in Oman, and Dr. Ronald Cordova, my colleague at Gulf College. So this presentation is outlined based on the following. Um, uh, we have first the discussion about the short introduction about the research, literature review, uh, the aims of the study, research methodology, findings, and uh, conclusion. I will, I, I think I did not uh, make it full screen. Slideshow, yeah, okay. I think this is better now. Please, please continue. Yeah, so uh, this presentation, uh, as I mentioned a while ago, it's outlined based on the introduction and literature review, aims of the study, research methodology, findings, conclusion, and uh, of course, uh, future uh, recommendation. So in today's modern world of business, um, they said that business is nothing with the use of technology. So these technologies make people's lives easier. So for example, you use uh, mobile apps and access mobile apps in purchasing products online, specifically during this difficult time of COVID-19 pandemic, everything is online. So many people sense their, their um, feedback, their customers' opinions uh, through social media. So they share the, the services that they have experienced through the social media. So due to the advancement of technology, um, actually social media have become popular and commonly used platforms for um, content sharing, uh, social um, networking, and uh, it's used also for digital marketing. So this application, social media, allows users to interact with each other and um, share their valuable information in real time. So social media are changing the way we communicate, the way we collaborate, and also the way we create things, okay? So it, it has a huge impact to the modern businesses nowadays. So this figure demonstrates a strong relationship between the business, the customers, and the social media. If you look into the screen, at the left side of the screen, you will see the business that represents any type of business. And then there is a customer who will write their feedback comments through the social media. So they say customers are always right. And business, they always focus on how they will make, uh, how they will satisfy their customers. So most of the businesses, they conduct survey as basis for improvement. But there is also a biased thing on survey. Because once you answer a survey, sometimes it depends on the mood of the respondent, okay? However, when they use social media to share their sentiments and to write their opinions, it comes from within their own experience. So they are actually, what we intend to this research is to analyze these sentiments to come up with a solution. So the examples of social media platforms are displayed on the right side of the screen. If you notice, these platforms include Facebook, Instagram, and other media as well. <clears throat> now, the customer, uh, the, nowadays, majority of the customers uh, share their sentiments, opinions, and feedback, either positive or negative, uh, through the help of social media platforms. In our case, we use the Twitter to get the sentiments of the 
uh, customers. So we researchers, we believe that social media sentiments and customers' opinions shared in online, if properly analyzed, they could come up with, uh, they could develop strategies to make customer service effective and efficient. Or maybe through the results of the analysis, they will be able to redesign their marketing strategies and embrace digital marketing uh, in order to make their business competitive in the market. So these are just few of the many reasons why we, the researchers, chose to conduct this research. So uh, traditionally, uh, the aims of the study is to evaluate and analyze customer sentiments that would provide relevant uh, decision making and redesign companies, dig digital marketing and strategies campaigns in the future. So let us just give you a few, uh, a brief uh, context of our study. We chose clothing brand industry in Oman to get the uh, sentiments of the um, customers. So of course, due to ethical issues, we were not able to include the name of the clothing brand in this research, but um, traditionally, the clothing businesses promotes products and services through various traditional method. Uh, let's say, for example, marketing channels like TV advertising, or maybe magazines, leaflets, and so on. But due to the rapid advancement of the technology, the widespread of social media, like for example, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, customers are easy to reach out. So in a study conducted by uh, West and Turner in 2010, they said that uh, gratification theory, they found out that customers would look into appropriate media outlets and valuable information for gratification purposes. So thus, social media become progressively famous media outlet for target customers. So in our study, we decided to use the text mining and sentiment analysis processes. And uh, if we are dealing about data analytics, so we analyze the data through text mining and sentiment analysis. And we use also the simulation approaches in order to get an analyzed customer's opinion. So what we did, we used the uh, Twitter API. If you are aware of the Twitter API, we use also the Rapid Miner version uh, 9.8 and the Tableau Desktop Professional, which is version 2020, to get the tweets of the customers. So we have only um, a total of 947 tweets using the keywords clothing brand, which is distinctively used in Oman. So if you notice the Twitter, if you go to the Twitter, Twitter is used by any person, any, any user all over the world. So when we analyze our, our uh, customers mining, we specified only in Oman. So those tweets that we took are from only from Oman, with a clothing brand uh, keyword. So if you are not aware of these uh, technologies, these are the two methodologies, are the two technologies we use in order to analyze our um, customers' opinions. So um, you may wonder why we chose text mining and uh, sentiment analysis. Uh, we chose that simply because text mining, if you look into the definition of text mining, text mining is actually defined as an automated process in order for you to discover the hidden but useful information. So what other people do with the, the, the feedback or our opinions? Normally, if I am a customer and I hate the product, and I am not satisfied with my um, with the services of the company. I will write my comments, my feedback, my opinion on their social media sites. It's either in Instagram. How we use this? These are data that are unstructured data. So we want to come up with a useful information. We will transform this data, unstructured data, into a useful information. So in our study, we uh, follow this framework. 
So we have three stages. The first stage is text pre-processing. The second stage is analysis. And the third stage is the visualization. So what we did in the text pre-processing. So we use the Twitter, we extract, we prepare the data, and we come up with text collection. And then the text collection, after we have the text collection, we apply the text mining, we get the result and we visualize. So in order for me to explain more about, about this, so we use this uh, framework actually to perform text mining and sentiment analysis. So if you can see in these diagrams, we have three steps divided into the text processing analysis and visualization. So to understand this um, process better, I will explain it uh, step by step. So there are many processes involved. Uh, first is the text pre-processing, uh, which includes the extraction, preparation, and text collection of, your, of our data. The data comes from the Twitter. So the first step would be data access and data cleaning. Um, Twitter consider, or Twitter has big data. So they have a lot of data. So what we did is we access first the Twitter with the help of Twitter API, and then we clean the data. So how we clean the data by parameters. There are parameters that we considered in order to, to clean the data. So for example, we remove the spaces. That's the first thing that we did. We remove the URL. Sometimes the customers, they will use the URL of the company. For example, I, I want to comment something about, uh, uh, let's say, guest brand. So you will put most of the customers, they put the guess.com that's url that's not anymore a comment that is a url of this particular company so it means that it's not any more useful for the analysis we need only the positive and negative feedback coming from the customers so second we did was to perform the data cleaning using the rapid miner to get, to get the exact tweet messages okay we clean the data which are not important unnecessary for data simulation. And then we remove also the other spaces, maybe the punctuation, other, other um, special characters involved in that message. So this process, we call it as unstructured data. So we will transform it in a structured data depending on the needs of the study. Dr. Rulo, so, yes? Dr. Rulo I'm sorry, but please speed up because time is, uh, is, is very tight now. Ah, okay. So I'll just move to the, the formula, which we, we, we actually used. So we have identified three scores for the messages. The first one is neutral. We score zero if both, both uh, positive or negative comments. So we know already that it's a positive or a negative. Positive means a positive feedback and negative means a negative comment. So we score zero if both of them uh, exist in that sentence or in that comment we use the positive polarity the positive score if the total positive words is greater than the negative words and we use the negative polarity if the score is negative which is the positive words is less than the total negative words so from the 947 tweet messages that we have analyzed we found out that uh 700 uh for a while huh 704 Yes, a total of 704 um, positive tweets uh, were given and a total of a total of 30, 40, 40, uh, which is neutral, and the 198 tweets, which is negative. So actually, this simply means that the customers appreciate the products and its services having a 75% approval rate or positive feedback from the customers. So we recommend that businesses may focus on the negative comments of the uh, customers so that they can come up with a clear marketing strategy, or maybe they can address specifically the issues and concerns of the customers. So if you look into this one, the figure demonstrates the distribution of tweets and retweets per user ID. It clearly shows that tweets messages have been retweeted and shared frequently. 
So the blue dots, if you notice the blue dots, these are the tweets retweeted. So from zero to 10. So that's the blue dots and the red dots represents those tweets that are retweeted 15 times or more. So what is the, what is the, uh, uh, what is the conclusion in here? It is a clear evidence that the customers tend to retweet the messages concerning the clothing brand for the benefit of other customers to see their messages and to see their um, comments and feedback as well so that the businesses can address whatever issues and concerns raised by the customers. So if you look into this figure, it shows that the distribution of sources uh, of tweets based on the tweet messages from the customers. So the graph shows the, um, the graph shows simply the, the customers are using iPhone. If you look into this left side, the first uh, column, you will see their Twitter, Twitter for iPhone. So it means that many of the users, they share their sentiments through the use of technology, which is the iPhone. So it clearly, it, it simply means that businesses nowadays must invest a lot in digital marketing as many customers have already access to various devices like iPhone, like Android, and uh, so on. So in conclusion, the researchers would uh, conclude that the businesses can process text data, analyze and visualize their data using the rapid miner and Tableau packages. And uh, we also recommend that this study is highly feasible to utilize customer sentiments and opinions using social media to redesign the, the marketing strategies of the, of the business. And lastly, the result of the analysis will provide a very good opportunity for the business to improve customer service and uh, added value and provide a better service and um, develop or build a strong customer relationship with their customers. So that's, for, that's all. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Rolu. Any questions? Please type your questions. Okay, if, if uh, we have no questions, I have one. Um, again, I think that uh, your presentation is very interesting because uh, using evidence, you showed us how uh, customers' opinion on, opinions on social media platforms uh, can impact uh, businesses and can give us insights, marketing insights, uh, on how people react to our different campaigns on social media. So if you could give a more um, concrete example of, for example, a company that is launching a new campaign on a certain product or a new launch, and uh, given the tweets and given the mentions they are using uh, on the posts, uh, how they can analyze the feedback, whether it's negative or positive, uh, how can they seek help of professional marketeers to analyze these data? Yeah, uh, there is a one company, I, I, I gave example in my own country, which is the Philippines. Okay, there's one company in the Philippines where, where in they use traditional method of accessing their uh, data. So they don't have yet, uh, maybe five years ago, they did not have any um, involvement of technology in their in, in their company and they are selling their products online but you know they they created the e-commerce portal to improve their services so after five years of having a feasibility study they found out that many customers are dealing with online even with even before the pandemic the many customers they would like to take part of online purchasing so what they did is at first they developed the e-commerce portal and then they created different social media uh, platforms. Like they have their own social media account, they have their own Instagram and so on. Uh, actually, they did not analyze their studies because most of the time businesses nowadays, they don't get the feedback in social media. That's missing nowadays. Right. Actually, the, 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 the birth of big data, the birth of data analytics and data science uh, 
now is the chance for the businesses to actually uh, implement this type of analysis so that they can get a real data and they can address also a real solution. So that's, for me, I think is the best example. Yes, yes, that's Yani, really very interesting because exactly as you say, even before the pandemic and with the pandemic, and, and the, yes, companies are using social media, but how do they know whether it's effective or not? So this yes. is the tool to know how and which campaigns are effective, which campaigns are not effective, what are the com the customer's opinion. So really, doctor, thank you very much. And I thank think you so your much. presentation was really interesting. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And have a good day. Thank you. You too. Now we have the next paper, which is which is titled uh, "Analyzing the Effectiveness of Advertisement in Marketing Commercial Events," uh, presented by Ms. Hiba uh, Toki. Uh, well, also another interesting paper and very much related because it's um, talking about or it's analyzing. Uh, given uh, qualitative methods and the opinions of uh, various uh, uh, stakeholders and managers, um, the effectiveness of digital marketing versus traditional marketing. And uh, the results are interesting because it's, uh, they suggest that, of course, digital marketing in Oman and all over the world, it can be generalized, uh, is much more effective given the pandemic and given uh, the technology uh, era we are living in, but also it suggests that uh, integration and uh, uh, integrated marketing communications are important. So uh, although uh, digital marketing is important, we are still also still have integration be between the different promotional tools. So now uh, I ask Dr. Uh, Ms. Heba, Ms. Heba, uh, just a second. Ms. Heba El Tuki uh, is uh, graduated with a bachelor's degree from Oman Tourism College. Uh, her bachelor's degree is in tourism and hospitality management. Currently, she's working at Halim International Company in Oman. And I ask uh, Ms. Heba to share her presentation and start, please. Please unmute yourself, Ms. Heba. You're muted. Sorry. Yes. Um, hello, everyone. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Heba Hilal Salam al -Tawqi, And today I'm going to talk about analyzing the effectiveness of advertisement in marketing the commercial events in Oman. One second. First of all, I would like to start to express my gratitude towards the countless efforts and guidance from various individuals. I'm grateful for the constant support from my family and my friends, which helped me in successfully completing my research project. I owe my deep gratitude to my supervisor, Dr. Farzana, who has guided me throughout my project by providing the necessary guidelines to complete my research project. I'm going to start with the introduction. For decades, product promotion was done through traditional advertising tools such as broadcast, TV and radio, print magazines, which includes magazines and newspaper, and outdoor advertising. Today, online advertisement is crucial for businesses to interact with a younger and broader customer market. Advertising is carried out through new media, including websites, blogs, text messages, and social media such as YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. I would like to first start explaining what marketing is. Basically, according to Deepak et al. 2019, marketing is a process through which businesses create, communicate, and deliver value to customers to provide some form of benefit to the organization and stakeholders. Therefore, marketing involves, basically, marketing involves luring the buyers by first studying and understanding their wants, their needs, and behaviors, and then catering it to these needs, basically. The need for advertisement practices increases throughout the industrial revolution. 
as there is technically no other way to encourage customers to buy a product. I'm gonna to move to objectives, the aims and objectives. The article aims to analyze the effectiveness of different advertising tools and marketing commercial events. One second. The main objective revolves around the following research question. To what extent are the advertisements effective in promoting commercial events such as exhibitions and comics? The, re the research objectives are as follows. One, to identify the various media channels of advertising used by event companies. Two, to compare the customer's perception of traditional versus social media tools for events. Three, to provide suggestions to marketing practitioners and event organizers on how to develop their advertising campaigns for commercial events. And lastly, four, analyzing the effectiveness of advertisements in marketing the commercial events in Oman. What is the importance of advertising and marketing? The importance of advertising and marketing has many advantages that can benefit many organizations, such as one, organizations can easily personalize their message to customers. Two, allow marketers to attract and influence customers' attention. Various studies show that advertisement of commercial events helps in introducing a new product line in the market, as well as expanding the existing markets. Understanding the effectiveness of advertisement campaign is of significant value to stakeholders of commercial events. Such fundamental knowledge helps managers keep a better informed decisions regarding the budgets, scheduling events, and making other strategic plans depending on promotion. What is, what is the definition of advertising? According to Armstrong 2014, advertising is a marketing communication that pays a non-personal, openly sponsored communication to endorse a service, product, or idea. Measures of effective advertisement. According to Kehende et al. 2016, effective advertisement entails how well an advert about commercial events accomplishes an intended purpose. Ways of testing the effectiveness of advertisement. Here I'm going to explain each and one of them. Let's start with customer's attitude change. Armstrong et al. 2014 proposed two popular measurements of effective communication, which are communication effect, direct rating, portfolio testing, laboratory tests, and sales effect. I'm first, I'm first going to explain the communication effect and sales effect. Communication effect comes under communication, which, had three, which has three types. The direct rating method. Customers are requested to rate an advertisement through online surveys, and then, rate, and then the ratings are calculated. For the portfolio testing, it assesses how customers perceive advertisements and if they recall the content. So basically, if consumers recall the content of the advertising, it's considered effective. The laboratory test. Apparatus that measures blood pressure and heartbeats are used on consumers after watching, listening, or reading an advertisement to determine their psychological reactions. And lastly, the sales effect. The effectiveness of advertisement could be measured by comparing the sales before and after the advertisement. If the revenue has significantly increased, then the advertisement media was effective in attracting customers. However, some authors argued like Wells that measuring the effectiveness of advertising using sales can be difficult and unreliable because their, reven their revenues fluctuate over time due to other factors such as product availability, market prices, and competition. Coming to the customer's attitude change. Attention is defined as focusing on something at a given moment while constantly maintaining mental efforts and avoiding disruptions. Having attention leads to understanding as well as the ability to remember the message for a long time. For the ad to be effective, it has to create a long lasting effect on the consumers. Due to, uh, due to cross cultural differences across the world, Advertisement content that may seem right for a specific group of people might be wrong to another subgroup. Negative attitude creates a uh, negative attitude makes the consumer feel that the advertisement was manipulative and had disruptions. However, positive attitude towards an advertisement, the consumers feel that the advertisement was not ma manipulative and they had more time listening, looking and reading the advertisement. So here, what we're trying to say is the advertisement is considered effective if consumers have a specific attitude towards the advertisement. 
Another thing to say is consumers' past experiences with a company, service, and products are the main determinant of the consumer's attitude towards a specific brand. Moving on. Effectiveness of social media in advertising commercial events. We all know, especially now during the pandemic, that many companies and many brands are moving to social media advertisements. Digital marketing is a tool used for managing the act of growing web traffic or brand recognition across social mediums. Social media marketing primarily focuses on creating creative content and seeks to capture viewers' attention on social media platforms. This would also convince audiences to share it with someone else, which is, this form of marketing is powered by the EWOM, which is the electronic word of mouth, which indicates that it leads to earned media instead of paid media, and it enables the firms to gain different objectives. Further noted that social media advertisements are flexible because an advertiser can customize them to suit other customers. Also, unlike traditional media, in social media, one can start and stop campaigns at will. As a result, unnecessary costs are avoided and planning is enhanced. In this case, online advertisement is considered effective as companies can easily personalize their message to customers and allow marketers to attract and influence customers' attention. Online advertising has taken over the current business market due to the increase in the use of internet and social media. For instance, in the past decade, digital transformation has been a savior for online advertising and marketing efforts. As such, the traditional advertising channels such as radio, television, and newspaper and billboards are declining. I want to also say one last thing about uh, social media advertising. Now, during the pandemic, a lot of people have stopped going to the gym. As such, online gymming, like having li uh, live workout classes started recently. Uh, also our conference that we're doing now online, all this wouldn't have been done without using social media. Effectiveness of traditional media and advertising of commercial events. I'm sorry, under easy to Ms. Heba, Ms. Yeah. Heba, I'm sorry, I have to ask you to speed up. Okay, um, I'm going to skip the literature review for now and go to methodology. Please. The research approach. This research will use a quantitative research approach. I'll skip to target uh, population. The research target population is advertising agencies, marketing companies, and the Amman Convention and Exhibition Center. The sample size was limited to a certain extent, focusing on managerial positions, which are CEOs and supervisors. And since the number of managerial positions was not large, the sample size consisted of 39 participants, which included nine managers, 10 CEOs, and 20 supervisors. The data collection procedure. The research will use primary data collection tools to collect data and gather information based on the topic, the questionnaire, which was the researcher des designed using a statistical package for social science, which is the SPSS, was distributed among various companies like Amman Exhibition Center, advertising and marketing agencies, and some ministries was involved, like Ministry of Tourism. The reason behind picking these specific companies is to assess the effectiveness of advertisement in marketing the commercial events. The research targets, as I said before, managers and CEOs. In analyzing the data, SPSS will be used to examine the findings of the survey. The reason behind selecting SPSS is that the software suits the type of the research being done. Also, the researcher has more knowledge on SPSS and will easily be able to analyze and interpret the data. Lastly, I want to speak about the limitations. Several limitations are likely to affect the research. First, the research has access, must have access to the citizens in Muscat, such as managers, CEOs, and supervisors that are willing to give up their time to answer the questionnaire. As such, this process can be time consuming and pricey. The next drawback is that respondents can be interested in sharing information that makes them look better, leading the possibility of bias. Also, since quantitative analysis may not permit a thorough study of attitudes and behaviors, researchers will not be able to ask real and analytical questions. Moving on to finding, findings and analysis. The questionnaire was developed by reading similar surveys based on effectiveness of advertisements and how it can impact commercial events, as well as secondary data was used to find relevant information about the subject of advertising effectiveness and the problems that could be faced while measuring the effectiveness of advertisement in commercial events. The question were formulated into two categories. The first one consisted of multiple choice questions that the respondents are 
that the respondents are presented a set of three answers they must select from, as well as the scaling questions that the respondents are asked to rank the following statements based on the rating differences between traditional and digital marketing channels on their effectiveness on commercial events. On a scale of one to 10, where one is considered least effective and 10 is considered more effective. The questionnaire aimed at providing the information to analyze the effectiveness methods in marketing commercial events. By the end of the analysis, the research questioned to what extent our advertisement effectiveness to promote commercial events, such as exhibition and comics should be answered. As we can see in figure 4.1, it basically talks about the position of the market. We can see that the least was the CEO with a percentage of 12.82 and the managers and supervisors and the members. So the members and the managers got a percentage of 17.95% and supervisors was more by 51.28%. Figure 4.2 talks about gaining awareness of various brands. As you can see, online media scored the highest with 82.05. I'm going to speed up. Benefits of digital marketing. We can see the wide range information is one of the, uh, one of the benefits of digital marketing as what the client said. And the challenges, of the challenges of digital marketing, many people said that they're often interrupting by 41.03%. Here we did the descriptive statistics in question 7.11 and 7.12. It provides a solution to question seven, statement number 11. In your opinion, the effectiveness of traditional advertisement and marketing commercial events are considered more significant than digital ad with a mean score of 2.7. And in question in statement seven, question 12, in your opinion, the effectiveness of digital advertisements and marketing commercial events are considered more significant than traditional ads with a mean of 4.205. So what this explains basically that the highest mean was 4.205, which means that the effectiveness of, of uh, digital marketing and commercial events are considered higher than traditional marketing. Table 4.2. T-test sample of question 7.11 and question 7.12. Same statement, effectiveness of traditional ads in marketing commercial events and the effectiveness of digital ad in marketing commercial events. As we can see here also, that the digital ad scored the highest mean point of 4.3, which means digital ad is more effective than traditional advertisement. The, tab uh, the table above specifies that digital ads with the highest mean of 4.3 and the lowest mean of 2.1 for traditional ads. The researcher concludes here that the digital advertisements are considered a popular way of promoting comics exhibitions more than traditional advertisement. Discussion of the findings. Effectiveness of digital media and advertising commercial events. Advertising and marketing commercial events and especially comics should focus on increasing the effectiveness of digital advertisement. Thus, a cost-benefit analysis should be done to validate the best method for individual exhibitions and comics based on capitalization, marketing goals, etc. Furthermore, the research found that the most of the population, which is 33.3%, prefer digital marketing due to the following reasons. One, the wide range information compared to traditional marketing. Other respondents prefer digital marketing due to its low cost, interactive medium, and time saving, with a rate of 15.3, 30.7, and 20.5. On the contrary, the literature review notes that the essence of digital advertising from social media whereby benefits are pointed out. According to literature review, there are quite several social media benefits in contrast to traditional media. Ms. Heba, can we go to conclusion, please? Yes, I'm sorry for that. The conclusion. The study uh, intended to analyze the effectiveness of advertisement in promoting commercial events. Okay. The marketing sector has evolved over the years. Therefore, there are many arguments on the most effective advertisement in commercial marketing events, such as exhibition, especially comics. Typically, there are various digital and, and traditional marketing networks, including broadcast, print, social media, and websites. Among these media, each has its benefits and challenges. Thus, companies must consider a cost-benefit analysis to select a suitable one. Nevertheless, the, the research findings specify that digital media is more effective than traditional one. The, this has been backed up by both the literature review and an analysis of the research data. 
the research, uh, the literature review has cited numerous advantages of digital media, especially in social media. While the research findings have a large, larger percentage supporting digital media effectiveness. Besides, it has been it has been stated that digital advertisement of commercial events is cost effective and reaches a broad market within a short time compared to the traditional methods. Thus, the paper recommends that marketing practitioners implement marketing strategies based on the current digital advertisement method. Recommendations. The recommendations. The research shows that there are many measures to determine the effectiveness of advertisement of commercial events. Based on the research findings and the literature review, brand image, awareness on consumers, attitude change are crucial factor, factors for selecting an advertisement method. Marketing practitioners should ensure that the services and products are offered in a commercial event are good of quality so that the consumers will have a positive image of the organization. This will lure customers into talking positively, which is the word of mouth about their brands to their friends and sharing it and sharing the advertisement content. Number two, the research indicates that the advertisements can influence the attitude of the consumers based on their cultural differences. Thus, when selecting an advertisement content, it is vital to consider how different target market perceives a message, such as the picture and the language used, as mentioned before. And three, it has been noted that the exposure is not the only sole determinant of consumer attending a commercial event. Thus, marketing practitioners should also invest in other factors, such as excellent public reputation, in addition to advertising its product. Number four, another recommendation for marketing practitioners is to maximize their opportunities and benefits of effective advertisement. For instance, the research shows that digital advertisements are more effective than traditional methods. Thus, marketing practitioners should move with the trends. The reason is that they will spend less money and time in reaching a wide market share. Lastly, it has been identified that digital marketing is prone to privacy issues. Thus, marketing practitioners should enhance their safety of users, such as reporting scam messages that use other organizations to mislead customers or share unsafe links through social media. Privacy issues can scare customers from clicking on ads, which can compromise the effectiveness of advertisement. And thank you, Ms. Heba. Thank, thank you. you very much. Um, now that you uh, have covered most of the issues, there was only one question. And I think yes. you covered already about the disadvantages or drawbacks of uh, digital marketing. And there yeah. was a slide that you already covered uh, mentioning the drawbacks. Would you like in 30 seconds to answer it? Because we are yes. past due our time. I'll just talk about one point to save time. As I mentioned before, privacy issues. Many people now have been complaining about privacy issues that all oh, this advertisement agency, how do they know what I like? How do they know what I share? How do, they, how do I know what they comment? I also did an experiment with my best friend. We both had Instagram and we're both following the same people. But when I open my Instagram and she opens her Instagram, it's totally different pages and totally sponsored advertisement that are totally different. Why? Because my likes and her likes are different. My perspective and her perspective is different. So many people are actually starting to get uh, annoyed by, let's say, by Instagram and Twitter who are sharing their, their data to advertising agencies. So this is one of the drawbacks that I feel uh, digital marketing is facing right now. It's with the privacy. Yeah. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And now with our third paper, um, which is titled Investigating Consumer Perception on Environmentally Friendly Cars in Oman, a Study of Hybrid and Electric Cars. Uh, another interesting paper uh, that investigates uh, a very uh, uh, up-to-date topic, uh, which is uh, the new hybrid cars and the awareness of the consumers and the consumer perception on emissions and on environmentally friendly cars. Uh, it will be presented by uh, Dr. Uh, Smoji Sudavan, uh, who is currently working as an assistant professor in computer science at Modern College of Business and Science, Muscat, Oman, uh, affiliated to the University of Missouri, St. Louis, USA. He has more than 17 years of professional experience in teaching software engineering at university level in both national and international colleges 
and I give the floor now to uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Sudivan uh, to share his present presentation and start. Doctor? Yes, good morning, good, good morning, ma'am. Yes, good morning. Thank you. One minute. Please share your screen. Yes. Can you see the screen now? Not yet. Can you see the screen, ma'am? Yes, yes, we can. Yes. Yeah, please start. 15 minutes maximum, please. Okay. Very good morning to all of you. Today, I'm going to present our paper, Investigating Consumers' Perception on Hybrid Cars in the Sultanate of Oman. My name is Dr. Smitu Sudhavan, presently working as a faculty in Modern College of Business and Science, Muscat. In this research, we did the background of the study. We know there are a lot of things around us changing exponentially. Because now we are in the pandemic situations, there are a lot of things around us changing drastically. One of the main things, if you consider the climate, the climate is also changed in a lot of severe, uh, severe effects, raised in global awareness on the carbon emissions. When you see the different domains, especially in the auto industry, is among the most notable producer of pollution. With cars and trucks, account, we consider, if you see the 25 percentage of CO2 emissions. In the research shows, there are over 1 billion car on the roads with the industry total revenue over 5 trillion in uh, uh, 20, 2017 and expected to increase to 9 trillion in 2030. When you realize the seriousness and the urgency to address this global warming, the industry players are shifting production to hybrid and electric cars. However, the studies have shown a widespread lack of knowledge of the commercial availability of hybrid cars. The total cost of owing the cars, the purchase incentives, the fuel and maintenance cost savings, the reliability and environmental friendliness. This may be true in all over the world. When you, when you see here in our country, here in Oman, give the limited number of automakers currently selling the hybrid vehicles in Oman. Our, the main objective of our study is to, to investigate the perceptions of Omanis, the car consumers on the hybrid cars, and its impact on the environment. For that, we collected the information by using the different medias. One of the way we collected by using the existing documents, for that we did a literature review. In the recent research shows, the author Ransom 2008 in his study shows the reason to buy the hybrid cars is one of the main reason is the fuel cost sake. And the recent paper from 2020 from Abu al -Khair, in his study shows, one of the reasons for moving towards the uh, uh, influencing the consumer factors is the price, the reputation of manufacturers and fuel economy. And Aman and his colleagues in 20, uh, 20, uh, 2012 studied the environmental knowledge and environmental concerns considerably affect the consumer's intention to move towards to the hybrid cars. Also, there is 2015 by Itani and Casa. His uh, study shows the seriousness of the environmental problem and environmental responsibility and the self-image is the factors. And 2010, there is an uh, Bilal and his colleagues studied the price perceptions and social influence and some of the risk factors also, it significantly impact on the purchase of hybrid vehicles. In our research, we use the quantitative research method mainly using for a survey method. In our studies, we did 100 questionnaires were distributed on the respondents with the 70% of response rates. 
And also we use the survey monkey was used for the data collection using convenient sampling method. And descriptive statistics are the main tool used for data analysis. In our findings, this is a profile respondents for in a demographic way. The most of the respondents in 79 percentage were male and 21 percentage were female. And more than half of the respondents with the 52 percentage of age between 25 to 15 years old and 42 percentage with age below 25 year old and 6 percentage above 50 years old. And 81 percentage of the respondents were Omanis and 61 percentage are um, are the graduates and 50 percentage of the response were employed with uh, employed with uh, also, also the 47 percentage earning below 500 real and 10 percentage earning above 2000 Oman real. This was our uh, finding a demographic profile of respondents in for the survey part. You can see the tabular format uh, representations. In the findings, in, when you see the respondents of perceptions on choice of the cars, most of these respondents, especially in 89 percentage of our study on petrol and diesel cars, and 7 percentage on hybrid cars, and 4 percentage on in electrical cars. More than half the respondents, 51 percentage, replace their cars with two to five years, and only 39 percentage of the respondents replace their cars over five years. In our studies, 46 percentage of the respondents said that they will consider buying hybrid cars because of its fuel efficiency. And 34 percentage of the respondents were more interested in the car price and affordability. While 20 percentage of the respondents would embrace it for its environmental benefits. And at the same time, the respondents' perceptions on environmental issues, when you consider the 77 percentage of people were concerned about the car pollutions, and 23 percentage of the respondents said that they were not concerned at all for the pollution part. And overwhelming, the majority of the respondents, 91 percentage in our studies, believe that the hybrid cars are environmentally friendly compared to the convenient vehicles. In this study, the 57 percentage of the respondents believe that the hybrid and electrical cars will completely replace the internal combustion cars. That means we are using the traditional cars in the near future, while 35 percentage of the respondents do not believe it to happen anytime soon. Finally, the conclusion. In people in normal, there have a tendency to change. So we need to adopt the changes. Now we are in the pandemic situations. Now we adopt the change for the conference we are conducting in an online mode from the traditional face-to-face -to, -face to, to the online. The same way, the people need to move, the need to adopt the change from the traditional uh, fuel uh, cars to the hybrid cars. That is very difficult. That is the, you know, always the resistance is there to moving towards from the traditional approach into to the hybrid approach. There is a need to educate it in the public about the economic and environmental benefits of hybrid and electrical cars. So that is from the government also need to give a lot of orientation to the people why we need to move towards to the hybrid cars. That requires a lot of efforts in the industry players as well as the government to promote environmentally friendly cars through that we can uh, you know, the sound pollutions also, we can um, uh, avoid a lot of uh, other issues. In our implication of the study shows, uh, the, especially in our findings, are compelling to the fact that the majority of the response were concerned about car pollutions and willing to buy the hybrid cars to save the environment because it's saving a lot of pollution as well as pollution, uh, you know, uh, the CO2 emissions is very less comparatively uh, the uh, uh, traditional cars when you go more to, towards to the hybrid. Therefore, we suggest that the government should provide more incentives to the people to buy the hybrid cars. The automakers should make the cars affordable and increase the public awareness on its economic and environmental benefits. However, the study cannot be generalized given the small sample size of the population. Hence, we are proposing the future study should increase the sample size and the scope of these issues.
thank you so much over to the chair thank, thank you. you very much doctor um i see no questions uh but i have a question uh, so from your perspective and from your uh, research from the results you see that there is a good potential once governments allow uh, allow this hybrid cars to function in the market there, there is going from a marketing perspective there will be high demand on it correct yes 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 Yes, so, and, actually, yes. Mm. Here in Oman itself, now the when you see there is a um, leading giants like a Toyota and all, they already shifted towards to the hybrid model. In 2021, they have a Camry, they have a Corolla and Rav4. Already they come up with the hybrid model, and the people are gradually moving towards to the traditional to the hybrid part because the government is also initiating these things and uh, the sound the pollutions and also the environmental pollutions we can avoid it. And the people are also, uh, you know, in here in Oman itself, uh, you can see the 2021 uh, Toyota, um, especially Japanese cars, mm -hmm. they are uh, moving towards to this technology. Mm -hmm. From an environmentally friendly perspective that they want to go, that the consumer wants to go environmentally friendly or from a, an economic perspective? Both aspects in economic perspective, as well as an environmental perspective, because it's in, you know, when you see uh, the, this type of cars will give you the fuel consumption will be very low comparatively to the traditional cars. It will, it will get a very good mileage if you have a hybrid cars, so that the people can save a lot of money. And at the same time, it is uh, avoiding all, we can prevent all the sound pollutions. Also, it will save the, you know, environmental aspects. Okay. Thank you. Another question that you got now. Uh, did you investigate the effects of all downstream industries attached to the traditional cars, such as fil filters and so on, resulting in job losses? Of course, maybe we did uh, some of the studies like that. You know, see, presently the cars they are trans they are adopted uh, with the maximum they are using the 2.4 engine capacity cars only. They can go to the hybrid cars. If it is a more than the capacity of 2.4 the companies they are not uh, insisting to to towards to the hybrid because you know the uh, engine capacity and all is not suit for this uh, type of electrical or hybrid cars so the companies are like uh, you know the, uh, the automated car service industries what they're preferring is if your car having less than 2.4 engine capacity you can adopt uh, this hybrid mode of uh, transformation yeah as as any transition in any industry any it happens and uh, substitutes are found thank you doctor uh, I appreciate uh, your you. presentation. Thank you all presenters and audience. This is the end of uh, this session. And in 15 minutes, we're going to start the next session. Actually, in 10 minutes, we're going to start the next scientific session. Please stay with us for the next session. Thank you very much and have a good day. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Yes, 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 yes.
Hello and welcome back everyone. Thank you for joining us at the second session for today's event. We now have the, the event part two of the session today, starting with our opening session, Chair Dr. Hisham Mekht, Associate Dean for Quality Assurance and Accreditation, Faculty of Business and Economics Head mod at Modern College of Business Science in Mustak Oman. I'm honored to introduce you to you this, uh, this session's keynote speaker, Professor Zahar Irani, who is the Pro Vice Chancellor at the University of Bradford, UK, Chairperson of Bradford Economic uh, CV19 Recovery Board at Bradford Metropolitan District Council. Professor Zahar has responsibility for academic innovation and quality account accountable through internal governance of co uh, for quality for faculty operations, director of marketing admissions and external affairs. He's also the director of student and academic services, director of quality and teaching enhancement and campus information services. As PVC, he also leads the transformation and growth of the university's undergraduate, postgraduate education portfolio through the faculty and professional services by driving innovation and enhancing the quality of student experience, teaching practice, curriculum development, and support for student learning success. I will now hand the mic to Dr. Hisham, who will briefly uh, have a few words and will hand the mic to uh, Professor Zahar. Uh, Dr. Hisham, the mic is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, uh, Professor uh, Zahiri, and good afternoon to our participant, and good morning to those who are in the U.S. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have Professor Zahiri with us, and he has definitely accepted our invitation. So welcome to the first conference ever in the history of MCBS in collaboration with the Arab Academy for Science and Technology and Maritime. It's a great pleasure to have you on board. Uh, just let me say that you have 25 minutes for the key address. And then after that, we'll have five minutes for question and answers. So the floor is yours. So take it away. And I'm sure that we'll be very much delighted to hear about the topic, which is a blind artificial intelligence for social good uh, tackling global challenges. So please go ahead. Thank you, uh, Dr. Hisham, uh, for uh, the uh, kind introduction. So uh, good morning and good afternoon, colleagues. I'm really pleased to be here to, uh, to give you a, an address, um, really to talk you through some of the exciting opportunities that uh, AI uh, can present um, for social good and some of the initial work that we are starting to uh, to look at uh, developing um, here in, uh, in in Bradford. So I'm Professor Zahir Rani, I'm the Deputy Vice Chancellor at the University of Bradford with a very broad portfolio and that gives me a real opportunity to um, take advantage of AI um, and also I have a chair position within the local government where I'm responsible for the economic recovery post COVID. And again, some exciting opportunities of how we can use AI to support economic good, to support also economic recovery. What I'm gonna do this morning um, is talk through uh, a number of things. I particularly want to stress the growing industry, the potential employment, as we've got most academics um, uh, part of this conference, um, it's really important that we get an insight into the employability prospects, but also the huge potential that AI offers in terms of new program uh, design and development, hopefully to service the needs of industry. Um, I then will talk a little bit what happens when AI goes wrong, because it's important as an academic, we give a balanced perspective, not just the positive, but also recognize that actually things do go wrong and give you some interesting examples of, of what happens when they do go wrong. I then want to spend some time talking about the UN Sustainable Development Goals and in particular looking at um, the opportunities for AI in trying to deal with some of these really global challenges and some of the issues that we face um, as, as a global community, global society, and in particular looking at the capabilities of AI and some of the technologies supporting um, some of the projects that are trying to tackle the Sustainable Development Goals. And then finally, I will end it on um, the challenges and risks, and I'll, I'll, I'll put a little slide at the end looking at some of the areas that we are focusing AI solution within the Bradford economic recovery context. So if we look at, at, at where jobs are and where the employment market um, is, it's interesting when you actually look at the, uh, the World Economic Forum, they're very clear in saying and identifying where they believe that the employment opportunities of the future are going to lie. And actually, if you just look at the uh, at the top 10 emerging market areas, sectors and job opportunities, you can see that areas around data analytics uh, and scientists 
uh, the use of AI, machine learning, um, are really the two top performers in terms of the additional 133 million opportunities that they see having been created. And it's also interesting to contrast the top emerging markets with those that are declining. And again, you can see a shift away from some of the more transactional opportunities uh, and roles that we have um, across uh, organisations in both public and private sectors and a focus largely on the technology enhancement, the value creation uh, job roles that uh, the World Economic Forum see as the future. So I think it's very clear that we as, as educationalists need to ensure that we can service this demand by designing and developing really interesting undergraduate and postgraduate programs um, that actually students want to study, but also that support uh, the future employability prospects of our young, um, of our young uh, graduates. If you start to look at, 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 at trying to transact some of those numbers into what the impact really is going to be, you can see that PwC predict um, the significant impact that uh, AI is going to bring in terms of um, gross domestic, domestic produce, but also in terms of, of the size of the market. And you can see that we're, we're talking in huge numbers, uh, you know, 15 0.7 trillion is just a huge number of when you start to think about the size of, of a market that actually didn't exist a few years ago that is is clearly got momentum and is now gaining a lot of uh, prestige a lot of opportunity and of course having a lots of impact um, not all social impact it's it's interesting that a lot of it is, is corporate impact um, but nevertheless i think again we've got an opportunity to try and see how we can broaden the impact that technology can have on today's society but it's not just AI, it's the use of blockchain and, of course, trying to make sure that we've got an auditable sequential process flow of our transactions and what the impact of blockchain is going to be to try and ensure that we can have a smooth transitional flow of workflow uh, within our organisational decision making, both the public and private sector organisations. So, again, the big disruptor is not only AI, but actually it's going to be the use of blockchain and combined, you can see the multiplier effect that's going to have on today's society. Having said that, um, things do go wrong, and, and often they go wrong for a whole variety of reasons. Sometimes it's because um, the technology is inappropriately applied. Sometimes the technology is not mature enough. Sometimes the application is not well defined, um, or the due consideration um, is not necessarily given. And what I've done there is just left a few list a few interesting examples, um, and, and and in particular, I quite like the three that I I love talking about because they're actually quite interesting. Is that um, AI was seen as a potential solution for employers to predict one's intelligence. It failed as a, as, as a project, and, and, and I'm kind of glad it failed as a project. I'm not sure I'd like somebody to take a picture of me and say, ah, we can predict what your IQ is going to be uh, as a child and, and perhaps how it's going to develop as, a, as a, an adult as you grow. Um, so that was a, an AI failed project um, and, and an interesting failed project. Perhaps that's not such a bad thing. Um, other interesting examples uh, was the use of Alexa technology and, and how it actually wasn't able in the early development stage. It's got a lot better now um, because of contextual um, uh, processes that it uses um, in serving content to, to users um, or those that use the technology. It has got better. And that's largely because the technology has got better. Um, but nevertheless, it still isn't, isn't foolproof. And the other interesting one was um, AI and its use in predictive decision making. Um, and um, AI was there was a number of competitions that were used around the world to try and predict the results of the 2018 World Cup. Uh, all predictions were wrong. Uh, and again, because there's huge variability on the day um, and in the preparation to the pre-matches, obviously the qualifying matches. So there are lots of factors that AI cannot take account of. Um, because, of course, it's only as good as the, as the historical data set that supports its decision making, of course, as well as the constructs and the design um, uh, architecture of the technology itself. So the point really is that AI is great. It's got huge opportunity. It is going to and is continuing to be a disruptor, but it can't solve all of the world's problems. And indeed, nor should it. And I think that's a really important uh, point to, uh, to stress. It may well in the future, mind you, but at the moment it can't. I think there are also a number of interesting things that we need to be mindful of as, as users of potential um, AI, benefiters of AI, but also people need to recognise that AI also has a large number of, of risks associated with it, in particular bias, 
is something that we've got to be very, very, very mindful of. Because of course, bias um, can lead to unfair outcomes. And, and quite often, the bias can be embedded in the historical data sets. And there was some interesting research done in the US looking at uh, the type of students that go to Ivy League universities in the US. And it concluded actually the best students to go to Ivy League universities were, were upper middle class white Americans. Well, yes, that's because the historical data set of students that go to Russell, that go to Ivy League universities in America, tend to be upper middle class white students. It's, it's the other type of students that just don't get the opportunities and therefore the data itself was biased because um, it's only as good as the data that you are using. Um, so there are issues that, that you've got to be very, very mindful when you um, start to use AI in the data sets that support some of the decision making and the fact that some of the data sets themselves may actually be um, corrupted or just not truly representative. Then there's issues around privacy and violation, um, breaching, um, um, being hacked and, and having your data um, used um, and all, all, also not just about the data that, that, that's, that's hacked but also the use and misuse of personal login credentials and actually there's a significant amount of, of data to suggest that uh, we ourselves often uh, misuse our, our, uh, our login credentials um, and obviously that can lead to a misuse and violation of privacy data. Uh, and then of course there's the unsafe use and security threats again which is something we need to be very mindful of and the harvesting of our own personal information um, that, uh, that can lead to a whole host of potential uh, corruptions and um, threats to our own personal financial as well as our uh, personal private information. One of the other complexities is around our ability to explain what we've actually done and how the technology is being used which is it's quite an interesting notion actually and, and a lot of that came from the lessons learned through the financial sector um, and in some of the previous economic crashes that have largely been driven by the development of financial instruments that are so complex one can't explain them to the lay individual and actually AI if we're not careful runs the same risk some of these models are based on very complex mathematics uh, of course, some are based on rather simplistic um, drag and drug um, um, structures, but actually some of the complex mathematics needs to be designed and developed in a way that we can articulate it and, and explain to people how decisions are being constructed, how decisions are being made, and the data, the type and the structure of that decision making, which is something that we need to try and make sure that uh, we don't get too absorbed in the technology that we can't actually explain how it's been designed and constructed. And of course, one of the other issues we've got with AI is potential displacement. You know, AI will take roles, will take jobs, as we saw in the earlier slide. Some of the more operational roles are actually now being displaced um, because, of course, technology is moving some of those roles out because they're being automated. I thought the McKinsey report that was produced in 2018 was, was a really, really strong report and that will form the basis of the rest of the presentation because while it recognises that AI in itself is not going to solve all of, of the world's challenges, it actually does identify where AI has been used uh, to solve quite a number of, of, of the real deep underlying problems we have. Um, and in many respects, some of the areas that the, the UN um, Sustainable Development Goal um, has been trying to um, trying to cover uh, and explore and actually what we're trying to do with the research that we're doing is identify what those secondary case studies are that exist. Uh, those used cases that can be used to try and build up the knowledge, build intelligence, build capability in order to try and learn and use that learning to solve, to solve other additional SDG challenges. I'm absolutely of the view that the technology now is sophisticated enough for, to allow us to solve, to innovate um, and actually to grow market share in particular areas, but also to have economic and have social impact. And I do actually try to use that approach in trying to encourage as many students as we can to take on the challenge of how we can use and better understand technology or indeed better understand trust how people need to change their approach to using trust and the behaviour in which we interact with new technology. Now in the UK, there's quite a big push in terms of trying to use uh, technology. And as you can see, uh, the government itself has, has ring-fenced and sees the potential um, that AI and new technology can add to economic growth and development. Um, and the NHS, which is um, our largest employer in the UK, is um, very clear in that in the use of AI in trying to operationally improve its efficiency, 
but actually also in terms of strategically trying to ensure that resources are deployed where they can have the greatest impact, uh, but also making sure that we've got a degree of equality, diversity and inclusion in the way that we approach the deployment of technology in dealing with, uh, in that particular case, uh, health related issues. I think it's also important that we're very clear in, in the kind of scale of, of development of, of technology. Uh, and of course, as we've said earlier, a lot of technology and AI in itself is procedural. It's used predominantly to deal with workflow, very mundane level. And that's fine because it does improve efficiency, it improves effectiveness. It makes sure that what we do is the right thing, but also that we do the right thing well. And that, that connectivity between efficiency and effectiveness is really important in dealing with these very operational level challenges. Then you've got the more tactical relationship issues that um, AI is solving, often decision-making. And these are really important um, issues because if we get them wrong, um, they can often be uh, life inhibiting or career limiting or actually financially detrimental. So these tactical decisions are often really important um, and actually is where we can add more value rather than the procedural workflow that the more procedural AI interventions can add. And then there's the really exciting, more strategic issues around um, and the example there is, is the autonomous behaviour that we've now started to see within some of the more um, advanced use of AI, which is actually taking human interaction out of the whole conversation, out of the whole debate, out of the whole process. And actually, we are having to trust the technology um, in order to allow its deployment to be sufficiently beneficial to our interaction and use of um, the instrument in, 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 in hand. I think one of the big things that we are lacking in terms of AI technologists is, is, is actually the, the used cases that we can build from. Use cases are really, really important because what it does is allow us to learn from the lessons of others, is identify where things are working and why more importantly they're not working so that we don't um, engage in the same failed decision making process. So developing use cases is really important. And of course, what we also try to do as, as, um, as academicians is make sure that we, um, we balance our impact and, and the students that we have in the use and deployment of their intellect, not just around um, economic good, which of course is, is no bad thing, but also trying to support AI for social economic change, global change makers. That in fact is, is one of the key things that we're very keen to promote at the University of Bradford and of course I'm sure many many colleagues on this uh, conference are very keen to do exactly the same too. Having said all of that I think there are five things that I would um, strongly um, suggest so I would almost say prescribe rather than describe that colleagues consider uh, the efficacy so making sure that uh, there is a, a good level of success a sufficiently good level of success to make it not a failed implementation. Efficacy, uh, making sure that the, 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 the resources that you do are the optimal level of resources uh, in order to allow processing to take place. We've talked about the explainability, which is making sure that you can quickly and easily articulate how the technology is being constructed and is being used to make informed decision making. Empathy, we're dealing with people quite often. AI is trying to replicate some of the human decision making the cognitive decision making processes and we need to make sure we have a way of trying to um, embed empathy where we can and of course the technology is getting better and better at doing that and very very importantly there is the ethical issue um, and, and and making sure that we, we undertake ethical due consideration and and, and and understand the ethical impact of our decisions um, in better deploying ai now, in terms of, of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, we know there's 17 of them. The two that I want to spend a few minutes just talking about today are around zero hunger and are around peace, justice and stronger institutions. And I chose those two particular ones because they're ones that I'm particularly interested in and they're ones that I think um, through looking at where there are used cases, we can show that there's a, a large number in the area of peace and a relatively small number in the area of zero hunger. And I think there are opportunities there to add value where already there's a large data set of use cases and add value where there aren't a large number, but actually there's a huge opportunity of trying to make an impact. And as you can see um, on the zero hunger, you can see that there really are a number of UK use cases that have had real strategic impact. Uh, these tend to be around economic empowerment um, and also around you know, health and hunger issues. 
Um, and I would strongly encourage colleagues um, that, have, have, uh, that are interested in doing research in this area uh, to truly really try to um, take advantage of these youth data sets that um, the McKinsey report has identified as strong, strategic in nature and having had a dramatic impact um, in the area of, of reducing uh, zero hunger. Um, at the other end of the scale, uh, you can see that uh, there really is very little work uh, around life below water, which is really quite an interesting uh, area, given that the majority of the world is covered by water. Uh, we don't really understand what is underneath that water, uh, but it might be interesting for colleagues to consider doing uh, oceanographic studies uh, where technology might perhaps play a role. Uh, the other extreme, um, which is, is where we at uh, the University of Bradford um, have in fact the world's first peace studies department. So while the majority of the world were looking at developing war studies departments, uh, the University of Bradford developed the first world's peace studies department. Uh, you can see actually there's quite a lot of, of, of use of AI um, covering everything from education to economic empowerment to security, justice. Uh, as well as um, uh, information on verification and, and validation of one's credentials uh, and decision making in the whole area of peace, justice and strong institutions. So quite a large data set uh, for colleagues to build from and be creative and learn most importantly from. And when you look at the kind of technologies that are sat underneath some of the, those AI cases that colleagues uh, may wish to consider, you can see there's a whole range ranging from the kind of deep learning structural to the natural learning processes and and i think we've seen huge increases in natural language processes uh, with the introduction and development of siri alexa all of which have really dramatically pushed forward um, um, that that area perhaps little less uh, in the area of natural language translation uh, that seems to be something that is gaining pace and you can see through the use of Language, language, natural language translation in areas such as Google, you can see that some of the software technology is improving dramatically. Um, but there are, again, huge potential areas, and I'd strongly recommend that colleagues look at what work has taken place up to now if you wish to innovate in the area of uh, hunger um, and, and health around food security. In the area of, of peace and justice, again, the, the kind of technologies uh, are slightly different, actually, so much more around um, the kind of the image vid video verification. Again, you'd kind of expect that when we're talking about security, so vid uh, video imagery and security. Uh, language translation, again, is something that seems to be uh, relatively limited, uh, but I do know that there's a significant amount of work that's been um, and is taking place. Uh, tracking technologies, um, the improved use of GPRS to um, uh, track individuals, track data, uh, track decision making again a significant development to work in that area and of course around optimization network analysis and analytics development so you get a sense of the kind of technologies that are there to support areas around peace security and justice uh, which is sdg 16 in the un sustainable development goals in terms of the challenges that we uh, we can see um, that there's a huge number of data challenges around those that are interested and uh, i guess even barriers to supporting uh, AI development and its impact in society around data accessibility. Um, and that's quite different from data availability. It, there's lots of data <coughs> that's available. It's just whether you can access it and more importantly, access it, access it in the right level. Um, and, and of course, is it of the right quality? Um, and the data uh, um, veracity has to be really strong for it to be meaningful as part of any data AI uh, set that you may use. Um, there is a limited uh, level of expertise, uh, availability and accessibility. Uh, we know that. You can see that through the workforce planning around the world. And again, there are huge opportunities for colleagues around universities uh, and colleges to try and make sure that we improve the level of education um, and capability and capacity to deal with some of those challenges. There are a number of regulatory image, uh, limitations around uh, security trust. Um, um, and I think actually governments around the world are getting better at trying to better understand what those limitations are. And of course, organisational deployment, efficiency um, and wanting to improve, but being cautious with improvements because they're worried about giving up and, and trusting the technology to take over some of the decision making that people have in, in, intensive, intensively historically um, given. But of course, before you start doing any of the AI modeling, you need to better understand the kind of data that you've got. And I 
I kind of refer you back to one of the papers that we wrote a number of years ago with colleagues um, at the University of Bradford. And in fact, it was for, for quite a while, was the most cited paper in the Journal of Business Research. And it was really looking at uh, what those big data challenges are and, and, and was broken into a number of areas. And the work that we did is we looked at the data life cycle and we, 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 we developed it into a, a topography of data challenges, process challenges and management challenges. And, and what we did is try to give a, a really good insight into what those challenges are and we developed taxonomies around them um, into those three topographies. And I think by trying to understand that challenge and that structure, um, colleagues um, as a starting point uh, are better positioned to take advantage of, of trying to uh, deal with some of the more challenging issues around AI. So in terms of the future, uh, go experiment, go play with these things. There are lots of um, analytical technologies and whether it's a neural net that you want to just download from the internet or whether it's uh, an algorithm, there's just lots out there. Um, go innovate uh, and, and go and disrupt. Don't be disruptive, but go and disrupt markets, go and disrupt uh, processes and go and, and, and use that as a real opportunity to, to experiment and, and look at how you can change, how you can influence, how you can add value. And some of the work finally that we're doing at the University of Bradford, one of the things that, that, that I've done uh, is taken on an additional role as the chair of the Bradford Economic Recovery Board. So I work, um, uh, I have been working with uh, the local government and we produced our post-COVID five-year strategy um, that colleagues may wish to take a look at. And actually what we have done is identified five priority areas. And these prime five priority areas, young and diverse population, we are the youngest city in Europe in terms of our um, population. And of course, that's really positive for us because it means that young people generally are interested in technology and we've got a number of innovative programs in AI and data science. And we want to understand how we can use those, um, that resource and, and use the technology to influence the green economy, influence culture and place, uh, influence uh, health and well-being, and of course, some of those cross-cutting themes that span across our whole area. I will end it there, and I think I hopefully am on time, um, two minutes ahead of time, and I think that might mean I can take some questions, but I'm not sure, uh, Dr. Hisham, uh, if there's uh, something you'd like me to do or not. All right, thank you very much. It was a very, very much interesting, and I know everybody now is talking about artificial intelligence, you're talking about the fourth industrial revolution, and I think I've seen one question from the audience. You're asking, now, where is artificial intelligence with higher education sector? Where are we going or where do we see higher education in the future with regard to artificial intelligence? So I can answer that in two ways. So I guess there are two, two answers to that. So there's the use of AI in higher education. And then there is the, the, the development of innovative courses in um, higher education. So let me deal with the, the last one first. The problem I see is that most universities that have degrees in artificial intelligence, you almost need to be a mathematician to survive on those courses. And that's problematic because the maths level of capability, and it generally comes from engineering faculties, I must say, um, it, it, it's quite demanding. And, and that turns a lot of people off in wanting to pursue um, a career in AI. Now, at Bradford, we did it two ways. So, so we, we, we do, actually, we didn't design an AI program um, that, that requires huge uh, mathematical uh, capabilities because actually you don't need to anymore. There are some fantastic programs and packages that have all the technology within. What you need to do is, is carefully spec out the problem. And that's the difficulty of it. You've got to be able to disentangle the problem articulate the problem in a way that you identify the parameters and the technology with the data that you have will simply solve it for you. So yes, there is a space for people with, with really strong mathematical skills to design those packages, but I think there's an even bigger space for colleagues that can articulate and disentangle a complex problem so that the technology can solve it for them. And that's a skill in itself. Now we, divide, we developed and we got some funding from the government, actually. Uh, we were one of an, a small number of universities that received funding from the government to develop uh, that kind of master's program that doesn't require you to be a mathematician. Um, actually, it doesn't even require you to have a significant STEM um, 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 background. What it requires you to is articulate and understand how to identify problems 
and then disentangle them into a way that you can solve them. That's a skill in itself. And then the application of technology, yes, of course, we will explain, but by and large, you can download um, um, algorithms, you can play with the algorithm, you can download neural networks. The technology is there, it's available. Lots of it is, is easily accessible. What isn't is your ability to look at a problem and to define it in a way that is solvable with technology. And doing that is something that we have been able to launch a massive programming. And actually it went straight in at our more successful in terms of student recruitment master's program um, in September. So by, by all definition, um, we, we're doing well in that area. Now, there is a role absolutely for a more mathematical AI program, but, but that is to design the P, that's to, that's to create the people that design the packages. What we're trying to do is to develop the people that can solve the problem, that they're different than the people that develop the, 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 the algorithms themselves. The second question, which was around the use of AI, huge, huge applications, largely I would think around blockchain technologies. Uh, so, for example, what we're now seeing is students saying we would like to have us, I mean, I'll give you an example. Uh, I can't find my high school diploma. I've got no idea where it is. But if I had it blockchained, actually, it would be um, a vaulted technology that would simply keep a record of really quite an important document for me. I don't need it anymore, but I quite like to have access to it. And actually blockchain is going to be a disruptor, I think, in a sector where in the future you won't come on stage to get to graduate and, and to get your maybe ceremonial you get your certificate but actually it will simply be either a qr code or a blockchain um, um, reference that will be stored and you will simply have reference to and you could give perhaps when you're looking to seek employment at, at, at another organization and there are lots of other examples around workflow around um, pushing student data across organizations in a much more efficient way than we do at the moment which is largely keyboard data entry which is very very inefficient and again if you look at um the earlier slide around the jobs that are disappearing it's the low level data um uh, entry jobs that are disappearing they're being replaced by smart workflow planning that is strongly driven by uh, good decision making with good heuristics uh, that are ai driven a uh, great answer. I'm going to just raise the last question because I'm sure that question is in the mind of all faculty. Is artificial intelligence will it replace faculty? Will, you... uh, will it replace faculty? Well, I don't think so because at the moment, um, you know, what students really, I mean, you can see this through this COVID pandemic. I mean, for example, I am now leading the development of the new student offer for our students for the next academic year. And what students are telling us is what they are missing are two things. They contact, not just with staff, but with each other. And they're missing the campus. And, and therefore, I think there is a role for the virtual, whether it's this kind of interaction, or whether it's, it's a role for students wanting to meet and have conversations with each other. Because actually the amount of learning that students have by having conversations with each other, the physical space, the environment are hugely important factors. And that's why I don't think that uh, the online educational experience is going to take over the physical in exactly the same way that I don't think that um, having a chat bot um, is going to take over me asking an academic the question I want to ask to get the answer I want. Um, I mean, how many times have we all engaged with a chat bot where we ask a question, but you get a standard answer? It doesn't really matter what you ask. You're getting one of 50 answers. That's kind of not education. So no, I don't think it will do. I think what we will find is that some of the processes that we academics deal with will just be taken away from us. So, you know, the, the development of slide material, the uploading of slide material, maybe some of the, the way that we handle, not the marking, but we handle some of the marks and, and the development of that into student profile. I think that's quite low level automation, but the added value will be in the narrative, in the dialogue, in the engagement, and that's the only value we can add. Otherwise, the rest can be automated far better than we can automate it with much, much higher degrees of accuracy. Right, Professor Zahiri, I think really this was an uh, interesting answer. Uh, I think uh, by then we want to conclude the session. And thank you very much for taking from time from your busy schedule and come to us and give us your key address. It was really fantastic. So. On the behalf of MCBS, as well as the Arab Academy for Science and Technology, I thank you for your time and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank, thank you very you much. much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye.
हेलो हेलो आई वेलकम टू द प्रेजेंटर टू द सर्विस क्वालिटी एंड इनोवेशन दिस प्रेजेंटेशन विल बी फॉर फिफ्टीन मिनट फॉर ईच प्रेजेंटर एंड आफ्टर द प्रेजेंटेशन क्यू एन ए विल बी देर द पार्टिसिपेंट दे कैन पुट द क्यू एन ए इन द चैट and let me introduce the first presenter that is sami saeed al shabani so sami saeed al shabani his topic is yes gentlemen his topic is impact of service quality on customer satisfaction and loyalty in luxury hotels in muscat Sami Saeed Al Shidani is committed and motivated tourism and hospitality management graduate with experience in service organization in Oman possesses a leadership and problem solving skill able to speak various languages and handle multiple tasks at the same time I welcome Mr Sami Saeed Al Shidani please go ahead Thank you very much Uh, can you see the slides yes go ahead please so uh, good afternoon everyone uh, my name is sami saeed saud al shirani graduate students uh, from oman tourism college and uh, today i'll be presenting to you my title my study title which is the impact of service quality on customer satisfaction and loyalty in luxury hotels in muscat uh before we start i'd also like uh, to thank my co-author mr raja for his constant support and uh, now we'll begin uh so first of all uh, the introduction of uh, the study so uh, as we know uh, many countries in the middle east uh, have been Uh, have been developing the hospitality industry the tourism and hospitality industry and uh, reducing oil dependency more and more uh, because we all know that oil will not last forever so tourism and hospitality is a unlimited way to generate income to a country okay and uh, of course uh, oman as a country has wit witnessed uh, growth in the tourism industry and uh, the omani government aims to reach 12 million tourists by the year 2040 and of course we all know that we are facing a huge issue now which is the coronavirus uh, which has affected the hotel industry and uh, revenues have declined very much since it started uh, the service sector is also known to play uh, a big part in an economy of any country due to the huge money generates in a country and uh, multiple studies uh, have been conducted uh, on the concept of uh, service quality uh, as an example we have uh, two studies uh, conducted uh, in the banking sector okay and we have another study uh, the supply chain and the logistic industry and uh, also the hospitality industry so the service quality concept is is a very popular concept and uh, it's a very uh, important concept for the success of almost any company or any industry okay so uh, the purpose uh, of my study the study aims to explore the service quality in omani luxury hotels to identify attributes that can result in customer satisfaction and loyalty uh, and the objectives of the study we have three different objectives objectives to is to assess guest expectation of service quality in muscat luxury hotels the second objective is to determine the key attributes recognized by guest in evaluating the service quality of muscat and the last objective is to measure guest satisfaction and loyalty towards the service offered in luxury hotels so if we look at the first objective and the second objective there is a link first of all we are checking what guests expect before going to luxury hotels and then later on we are seeing how satisfied they were when they experienced these luxury hotels 
And of course, we have uh, the research question. What effect does the service quality have on customer satisfaction and loyalty in Muscat? So by the end of the study, we have to answer this question, whether, uh, wh whether there is an, a positive effect or a negative effect of service quality. Originality, uh, the study is actually unique uh, because we don't have any previous studies done on luxury hotels when it comes to the concept of service quality. And the study will be valuable to multiple bodies, multiple uh, people, for example, practitioners, governments, and to tourism development companies, and also future researchers. Future researchers can dig deeper and uh, use uh, this study uh, to guide them further. Okay, so in the literature, literature review of the study, uh, we have uh, multiple things such as the server qual model. Uh, what is the server qual model? The server qual model is a tool used uh, to measure service quality. And it's one of the uh, very, very popular tool uh, to measure service quality. And uh, it's used more than any other tool in terms of service quality, measuring service quality. And of course, below the server qual model, we have five different dimensions known as tangibility, reliability, responsiveness, assurance, and empathy. So we measure service quality uh, through these five dimensions. And uh, in the literature review, we also have service quality. We have customer expectation and perception of service quality, and we have customer satisfaction and loyalty. Okay, so for example, uh, when, when we come at the literature review, service quality, uh, we have multiple studies done before. Okay, for example, in Pakistan, luxury hotels, room service, hygiene, uh, reassurance, and complaints were considered considered as the most uh, important attributes when it comes to service quality. And we have another study done in, in luxury hotels in Indonesia. Okay, and also we have customer expectation and perception of service quality. As we can see, we have multiple studies done and each, studies, uh, each study has a different result, okay? For example, the first study, as we can see, uh, expectations significantly vary across domestic and international guests. So not all people have the same expectations when it comes to service quality. Some people have high expectations, some might have low. So we have different results when it comes to different studies in different countries. And of course, we have customer satisfaction, uh, the same thing, uh, studies re revealed different results. I won't go through them all because of time. And of course, we have uh, customer loyalty. Uh, for example, a study done in the Indonesia and Thailand, and uh, also results were uh, not the same. We have different results. Okay, so when we come at the methodology, okay, uh, philosophical assumptions can be categorized into three types. Uh, this study adopted uh, positivism, since the researcher already developed uh, an in-depth understanding of uh, the research uh, phenomenon using previous empirical ev evidence. So I chose positivism uh, due to my understanding of service quality through previous literature review, previous studies. Okay, and the research approach uh, was quantitative, okay. Uh, as uh, you can see the author here, first line, uh, noted that a quantitative approach is an approach that looks at cause and effect. And our study is, uh, is about cause and effect because it's about the impact of service quality. So that's why we, we leaned into quantitative approach. And uh, the research approach is also considered a deductive approach. Uh, the research design, okay. Uh, so as we can see, the author there uh, justified that a, a descriptive approach allows the researcher to identify different phenomena, uh, different causes of phenomena. Uh, so the study adopted the descriptive uh, research design, okay. And uh, the other reason of uh, choosing a descriptive research design is because previous researches uh, adopted a descriptive research design more than any other design. Data collection and analysis. Uh, the researcher, of course, I adopted both primary and secondary sources. Uh, so the questionnaire actually consisted uh, five different parts. Of course, we have demographics, expectations, 
okay, attribute ranking, satisfaction, and loyalty. And of course, these were we analyzed all these using SPSS software. Okay, so we have the finding and the, and the discussions. Uh, so as we can see, gender, we have 50% men and 50% women. We actually had a total of 100 respondents. So we had equal numbers for men and women. And uh, age ages were different from 20 to about 50. Okay, and uh, of course, uh, you can see Marshall's status. Uh, single were 31%, married 55, divorced uh, 10, and others for and purpose of visiting. We have like tourism, uh, people who visited for tourism, business trips, leisure recreation and entertainment, and uh, other purposes. And of course, uh, they were also asked uh, about their monthly income, but of course it was confidential. No name was uh, needed. Okay, so uh, now, when we go back to the first objective of the study uh, to assess guest expectation of service quality musket luxury hotels, okay? The study presents uh, that, uh, that uh, expectations of uh, customers were very high. They had good expectations when it comes to luxury hotels in Muscat. As we can see, uh, most of the means are four, uh, for example, the first mean is 4.71. Okay, which is a really good result, which is near, which is, which is close to five. Okay, so the low and the lowest we have here is three. So expectations were almost all high. People had really positive expectations when it comes to luxury hotels in Muscat. And as we can see, all the results here. Maybe if we go below uh, 3.5, we can say expectations are kind of uh, not good, but most of the expectations were good. And as we can see, we have all dimensions, five dimensions, tangibility, assurance, uh, responsiveness, empathy, and reliability. However, in previous findings, okay, for example, we can say the first study findings revealed that the hotel customer expectation uh, were, 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 not, were not met for all five dimensions. It was with one, with one, with one, uh, quality by adding new facility. So for example, my study, uh, uh, for example, my study, uh, uh, so uh, actually my study revealed that all expectations were really good. However, uh, as we can see the study here, which was done in 2019, uh, revealed that expectations uh, were not well met. Okay. Of course, we have another study with different results. Okay. And uh, when we go to the second objective, okay, uh, we can see on the table here we actually uh, we actually chose different attributes, ten attributes, and we ranked them. Okay. Uh, the customers rank physical facilities are visually appealing, got uh, the highest rank, okay, as the most important attribute. The courtesy and positive behavior of employee got the uh, most important attribute, and all the way down or fifth, they have different attributes based on their importance. And of course, we have uh, different studies also here presented. Okay. Uh, for example, on the study in 2018 uh, reported that uh, service added and efficiency facilities were the most important. And the other, and the other study in 2017 also done in uh, luxury hotels uh, like Campus in Mandarin Orient, Grand Hyatt. Okay. Uh, demonstrated that positive behavior and creativity were the most important attributes. So, uh, actually, results were different between my study and different studies. Okay, and uh, when we go to the last objective, okay, uh, the study presented that uh, people, uh, uh, that the study uh, presented that uh, people were very satisfied. Uh, towards uh, service quality, okay? When we went, uh, when we go back to the expectation, expectations were really good, okay? And now here we have satisfaction after experiencing 
the different luxury hotels in Oman. We have uh, means, uh, like for example, the first one is 4.85, which is really good. So we have really positive means uh, based on the responses of, uh, of the customers. So, which means that customer expectations were well met by luxury hotels in Muscat. Okay, and uh, for example, here we have uh, two more studies, okay, conducted. Uh, for example, the first study presented that reliability influenced. Sami, you have two minutes study. more. Okay. Sami, you have two minutes more. Okay. So I'll just skip here. As I said, we have different uh, results based on other studies. Okay, and uh, to conclude uh, this study, okay, the relationship between all study variables will, were, uh, was statistically significant. We had really positive results when it came to expectations and satisfaction. Uh, the study will create better understanding of service quality in luxury hotels, okay? And uh, further studies on service quality attributes are desirable. So I really encourage uh, uh, more people to, do, uh, to dig deeper and do more studies because uh, this study is not enough uh, and uh, it didn't cover all luxury hotels in Oman. Yeah, we have multiple hotels, but it didn't co cover all luxury hotels. And of course, when we come uh, to the recommendation uh, to further improve service quality, uh, the following has been suggested. Okay, so for example, the first one, hotels must improve, uh, provide higher incentives to employee. So by giving them higher incentive, uh, this will motivate them to provide better service quality and uh, to stay in the organization longer and uh, add new facilities uh, that are currently unavailable Okay, this will also add something uh, to the luxury hotels invest in marketing. Okay, uh, why invest in marketing? Uh, people have to know what kind of service quality the, the, these luxury hotels are off offering. So marketing is also really important. And finally, ensure that service quality in luxury hotel is always maintained. We have good service quality. We have to be better than that. And we have to make sure that we we maintain and not uh, not uh, go down in terms of service quality. So of course, even though uh, luxury hotels in Muscat had really good results, okay, uh, still we recommended some things uh, to make it even better. These are the list of reference, and thank you for uh, thank you for your time. Do you have any questions, please? Uh, the mute is, uh, you're muted. Hi, Dr. I'm sorry, I'm muted. Unmute your mic, please. Sami, Salaam alaikum, Sami. Alaikum salam. You did a very good presentation on service quality in, uh, in service quality in service industry. How about in product? Will it affect the service quality? Uh, come again. In the in the production line, will it will it affect the service quality? If the service quality is good, how about the production line? A customer will be happy. Yeah, they will actually. It will be happy. Okay. Thank you very much, Sami. So nice of you. I would like Thank to call the second. Time. So nice of you. Thank you, Sami. Thank you I would very like much. to call uh, Ruqayya Al Jabri. Ruqayya Al Jabri. Yes. Okay. Her presentation is Ruqayya Al Jabri. Ruqayya Al Jabri. Okay, her presentation is utilization of convenience food as trend among fine dining restaurant in Muscat. Rokaya is a coordinator in Ministry of Defense. The author completed her degree of Bachelor of Science in Tourism and Hospitality Management from Oman Tourism College in 2020. She's a good researcher and recently she completed her bachelor degree. So wish you good luck, Rukiya. 
Please go ahead. Yeah. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I just check. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Rukhaya Al Jabri. Sorry. My name is Rukhaya Al Jabri. I'm a student at Oman Tourism College. Uh, um, today I'm going to speak about my research, my study, which is about the utilization of convenience food as a trend among fine dining restaurants. First of, first of all, I'm going to speak about what I'm going to speak in my presentation, which is the introduction. I'm going to speak what's the meaning of convenience food, the aim of the study, the objectives of the study, the relevance of the study, the literature review, which will cover the categories of convenience food in the fine dining restaurant, the trend and factor in selecting convenience food in the fine dining restaurants. Also, I'm going to speak a little bit about the advantage and disadvantage of convenience food in fine dining restaurants, then the methodology, finding and discussion, conclusion, and then the recommendation. Uh, First of all, that food is a culture thing because it represents the people, the country, the way of life, sometimes the culture also. So there are different uh, authors who mention about the convenience food. For example, we have Gofton 2015 clarify that convenience food is another conventionally used concern. It's about healthy or proper food. Also convenience food was characterized by either entirely or virtually prepared food, but in long planning and preparation, generally skills and complicated input can make a very simple. This is according to TROP 2013. And we have also both of 2014 emphasized that convenience is re re relatively similar to comfort food to be helpful. Uh, it needs to fit into a valuable example of temporary practices. Also, food, a typically complete meal that has been pre-prepared commercially and which has need only a minimum or without any further preparation, this is according to Jackson and Pihov 2016. Uh, uh, my study aim that uh, is to investigate the trend and utilization of convenience food as a trend in the fine dining restaurant around Masqat city uh, in Oman. And uh, there are four uh, objectives in my study, which want to achieve. The first one is to identify the most common convenience food categories, which are served among the fine dining restaurant. Then also to determine the different trend of utilizing the convenience food in the fine dining restaurant. Also to investigate the utilization of convenience food by the fine dining restaurant. Then the last one is to analyze the customer level of satisfaction with the food which are serving by the selected restaurant. Uh, this study, it's a very important and has uh, some relevance now nowadays that we see that Oman has become a very busy society. Uh, so uh, in Oman, even we can see that uh, most of the time that husband and, and wife, uh, both of them are working, so they don't have the time of cooking three, uh, three meals a day, and even they don't have the time to sit together to eat these three meals a day. So instead of taking like an unhealthy food or takeaway food, I think that uh, this study will help them to, to increase their awareness about the convenience uh, food and how much it can be uh, sometimes uh, like has a more uh, advantage and uh, healthy food. Also, Omani lifestyle, uh, like, uh, like it's changed. Their lifestyle is changed. So they are like uh, going to, to, to eating like fast food they like to eat outside for enjoyment or even sometimes because they don't have time. And also this study, it helped the restaurant, which because of especially now because of pandemic uh, COVID-19, we can see that uh, we can see that the government are taking different different rules and regulation, not regulation, different rules to minimize the number of the COVID-19, to, to minimize also the spread of COVID-19 in the country. So they are starting to like shut down the restaurant, then they go back to take only the takeaway from the restaurant. So I think that uh, convenience food, it, uh, it can be uh, helpful for the restaurant so they can cover their, uh, their uh, reservation, they can cover uh, many cover from uh, their customer. Uh, that we can say that convenience food has many variety. 
So it's sometimes we can say it's not only depending on of the way of cooking. We can see that some convenience food are cold, hot. So we, so we can categorize them on different way. Uh, the convenience food which are in uh, fine dining restaurant can categorize in in my study can categorize in uh, three. Uh, three way, which is uh, ready to eat food, ready to use food, and ready to cook food. According to uh, according to Scholar 2015, said that the ready to eat convenience food it could be directly consumed after purchase, which sometimes even no need to do any preparation, and sometimes it need only heating or defrosting or a little bit of uh, cooking. The ready to eat food can be a dairy product. A dairy product, for example, we can see the cheese, like the yogurt, butter, margarine. And then also in this dairy product, we can see also the like the dairy sweet, dairy bakery, like for example, the items we can use in the bakery, like the cookies, uh, marble cake, and uh, French cake, English cake. Then also, uh, also we can see the the beverage from the convenience dairy product. Which is, which is like, for example, the flavored milk, the flavored yogurt also. Then we have the processed, uh, uh, processed food, which is sometimes coming like jam, the can, uh, the can tuna, for example, can chicken. All of these can called, uh, can called uh, ready to eat convenience food, which can make, which can make the work more efficient and which can also help to reduce the, the, reduce the time of making this food. Also, we have like the frozen food, Frozen food, we can get uh, frozen food. We can get, for example, the potato wedges, hash brown. We can also get uh, frozen uh, chicken, and also we have uh, the frozen chicken, which I mean, which is already which already cooked. So it need only like, for example, a reheat or something or defrosting. Then we have extended snacks. We have also breakfast cereal. All of these are coming under the ready to eat food. The second one, which is the ready to use food. This ready to use food, according to Jackson and Vihoff 2015, emphasize, emphasize that the, the ready to use food, it's that item which need only a little of cooking preparation, like frying, steaming, uh, before, uh, before uh, consume. Uh, for example, we have all of these are, are using in the fine dining restaurant. Uh, for, for example, we have masala, which masala we can find in like powder, or we can, it can be in paste, like for example, the Thai curry paste, we have also the, uh, the fresh cut vegetable, uh, even for example, from my previous, from my previous um, uh, experience, I was working in a hotel, we, uh, we are using in five, five star hotel, which is Shangri-La Resort and Spa, they are using much of fresh uh, cut vegetable, which can help them to, to run uh, their business, which can help them to increase their sale also because of the full occupancy. Then we have also the ready to cook food, according to Cook and Blogger 2013 says that the ready to cook food that product are items that would, which need the only, uh, which need like uh, cooking. Uh, so it's only a few preparation are done. A few steps of preparation are done, then the restaurant has to make the other preparation. For example, we have noodles, beans, we can say also the rice. So then if we speak about some of them are saying how come fine dining restaurants they, they are using the, for example, fine uh, convenience food, because some people thought that oh, convenience means unhealthy food or convenience means like fast food, but it's of course, it's totally different convenience. We have lots of uh, healthy convenience food. That's why I came up with the advantage and disadvantage of convenience food in the fine dining restaurant. For example, the advantage of this convenience food for the restaurant it can it can make this this it can make the work more efficiency, which can also help to saving the energy and also help to in uh, like yeah. yes. You have five minutes more. Five minutes. Five. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 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 So so I will I will speak about the advantage very fast. Okay, the convenience food, it's very, very nice. It's like it has more efficiency for, uh, for uh, fine dining restaurant. 
even it can help them to reduce the manpower so they they can they can save their cost and also they can get more uh, convenience food this convenience food help them also for the seasonality for example the strawberry avocado we cannot get in all season so for example if the guests are asking for they, they said i want to eat mango and because of seasonality of course there is no mango so that restaurant will prepare that mango because already they have from convenience food, which is, for example, a frozen or already like, uh, you know, this is what I'm meaning. And also it can help them to like to, to decrease the wastage, also the convenience food, because, because the timing, the shelf, uh, it, it be for a long time. And also, of course, there is some disadvantage from convenience food. Some, some of them said because it has uh, the, uh, more content of uh, salt, like, uh, for example, sugar, less protein and all of this. That's why the restaurant are taking some, some criteria and some uh, factors which can help them how to select this convenience food like we have the chemical components uh, because the factories are using using for example salt to enhance the flavor of the food of the convenience food and some of them are using uh, sugar for example in the sweet product okay so the the convenient the fine dining restaurant are always looking on the component of this salt uh, sugar for example for, for the sugar if we talk about the juices they are always looking for the fruits which are not contain a syrup sugar syrup or uh, and also for the food which has a less, a less, uh, a less old, only uh, amount of uh, salt, and also another criteria which fine dining restaurants are using to select the right, the right uh, convenience food is packaging and labeling, because the restaurant always they make sure that when they purchase the food they make sure that the food always with label so they can read the nutrition, they can select what's the healthy, what's unhealthy food. Then also we have the central quality, of course, because the, always the fine dining restaurants are caring about the test to be, so they, the, always they will be with like a special, uh, and <laughs> I try to be very fast. <laughs> okay. Two minutes more. Yeah, okay, then the methodology I distribute to. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, okay, the methodology I distribute two questionnaire, which is two respondent. One of them was for the restaurant itself, for the, for example, the waiters, chef who are, uh, who, who knows about the food. And the other one is was for the customer to measure how is the customer satisfaction. Of course, the customer who are eating in that selected restaurant. In my study, I found that most of fine dining restaurants in Muscat are using the ready to cook food more than the ready to use food and uh, ready to uh, ready to eat food why ready to cook food to make sure that the, the like the the ready to cook food it gives them the time to make according to their recipe according to different things even the size how is the th size for example of the carrot the size of the meat so that's why they are always looking to the ready to cook food then the trend which makes the, which makes the the final restaurant to select the the convenience food it's because most uh, most of uh, Respondents said because of the busy life of the consumer and last of them said because of uh, packaging and label I'm trying to go fast and fast and always they make sure that they, the restaurant make sure when they select this food that the sensory quality the quality it's the best so first of all they are checking the quality then they are going for the price and uh, the brand and also for uh, for uh, utilizing the convenience food the sensory quality as we said it's coming the first one then we can see that the last one it's coming there for the uh, which can help them for the preparation time and also when we measure the customer level of satisfaction in uh, in uh, eating this convenience food in the restaurant we found that this uh, we found that it's a high a high from a frequency from the from the respondent which is the customer who are eating there and when we check the satisfaction on the food which are serving, which are serving in this fine in, uh, fine dining restaurant, we found that the sensory quality, the guests like the quality, they like the variety of the menu because of, for, for, uh, as we said, that the convenience food helped them to make different different things uh, very fast without uh, uh, with reducing the amount of uh, power. And this is the conclusion we found out. We found out that convenience uh, the fine dining restaurant in Muscat are utilizing the ready to eat food 
sorry, ready to cook food is the most. And result also reveals that people fast facing lifestyle in Oman because of uh, that's why they are like to, to use the convenience food and the satisfaction of a customer on, uh, you, you, of, on uh, eating convenience food was high. And there are some little uh, few recommendations. I, I recommend in, in general, I recommend some authors and some uh, more studies in these things because of COVID-19. My study was uh, my study has more uh, limited because no time I cannot enter inside and that's all and thank you for listening. <laughs> Any question? I cannot hear you, Dr. Muhammad. Dr. Muhammad. You can hear me. Yeah, now okay, yes. I have a question for you. Yeah. What are the drawbacks of processed and ready to use food on the human health? The ready to use? I read again. What yeah. are the drawbacks of processed and ready to use food? on human health it of, human of health it, yeah yeah human health you mean the conf convenience food right the process uh, convenience food it affecting the health because of let's say the tuna in can it's a processed food okay so it mm -hmm. contains some salt some oil which help this tuna to stay for long so this this amount of salt can affect can affect the human health for example if we say yeah you got so those who has the blood pressure, they should not use it, is it? Yeah, but they have to make sure. But in, in a fine dining restaurant, that's why I'm telling they are always reading the label, the label okay. of the nutrition, the house, the amount of these things. So that's why always they make sure that they are checking the uh, chemical components of these items. Okay. So nice but, of you, Rufia. But, Good but presentation. You have, but when you yes. go find dining restaurant, don't think that I'm going to eat convenience food <laughs> because there are many, many convenience healthy food. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. So nice Thank of you, Rupiah. Good presentation. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I would like to call Tina Ren. Her topic is characteristics, challenges, and opportunities of vaccine cold chain. Tina Ren. Okay. She is from department. She is from Department of Mechanical Engineering and Maritime Engineering, Liverpool John Morris University, United Kingdom. She says she looked after and she's undergraduate study of Prudent University she did, Indiana, United States. Majoring in material science engineering from 2015 to 2019. Now she is first year PhD student at Liverpool, John Morris University, Liverpool, UK, with research with concentration on cold chain packaging risk management system. Thank you. Please go ahead, Ren. Ren, please go ahead. All right, thank you. So Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Tamara Rind, and I'm currently a first year PhD student at Liverpool John Moore University. And thank you very much for having me here today. And the topic of my presentation um, today is going to be characteristics, challenges, and opportunities of the vaccine cold chain. Um, so the overall overview of my presentation today is first, I'll shortly go over the aims objectives and scope of um, this research paper, and then there will be a short literature review of the uh, current development of the vaccine cold chain. And then I'll be talking about some of the uh, innovative techniques or methods regarding the vaccine cold chain in the last five years. So um, the purpose of this paper mainly is to investigate the characteristics challenges and opportunities of the current vaccine cold chain. Um, so, and the presentation today can be divided into two sessions. And the first part will be mainly about um, the literature review of the current development of the vaccine cold chain. And for the second part, I'll be talking about some uh, innovative methods or techniques um, about the vaccine cold chain in the last five years. 
So um, the vaccine cold chain. So first, let's try to understand what vaccine cold chain is. It is basically the supply chain of vaccines or other pharmaceutical products that need to be kept uh, refrigerated, which is also known as the cold chain or the temperature controlled supply chain. Um, the major task of a uh, cold chain is to control and monitor the temperature um, during transportation and storage. And there are two major components of, of a cold chain, which are the cold chain infrastructures or the cooling systems and the cold chain management systems or the monitor systems, including the temperature monitoring or the, uh, and the quality detection um, of the vaccines during uh, a cold chain. Um, it is important to monitor the temperature continually and some common ways of um, cold chain temperature monitor are the uses of passive labels or tags indicating the shelf life of the products. In the past few years, um, the cold chain has improved a lot through the use of new technologies such as the vaccine valve monitors and some other new equipments such as the um, solar direct derived refrigerators and the long-term um, cold boxes, uh, which will be further explained in coming slides. So um, different vaccines are found to have different uh, formulations and different characteristics. For example, um, aluminum adjuvantive vaccines are very freeze sensitive compared with um, other types of vaccines, and the research attention has found to be shifting uh, to focus more on freezing since 2007, and for vaccine cold chain exposure to temperatures outside the um, recommended temperature range can cause great damage to the vaccines, and exposure to both heating and freezing can lead to uh, vaccine damages, and some of the um, uh, traditional coping methods are um, the temperature uh, are the vaccine uh, valve monitoring um, and the uh, freeze detection test and usually the impact of the heat damage is cumulative and the uh, use of vaccine valve monitor aims to estimate um, the remaining shelf life of the vaccines when uh, vaccines are exposed to continuous heat and um, also the WHO shake test is, is designed to detect if um, freezing has happened in a vaccine well. And although these uh, conventional um, coping methods are effective in some ways, and for most of the time, it still requires a cold chain for vaccine transportation and storage, and the vaccine and cold chain are still facing some challenges. Um, so, uh, the first challenge it would be that cold chains do not always function perfectly and inadequate temperature maintains can damage the vaccine um, potency. And secondly, the cold chain infrastructure and facilities are sometimes uh, limited or dated in some regions um, due to um, like lack of power or fuel. And then the last challenge uh, um, of vaccine cold chain would be that um, the coaching equipment is usually expensive and the effort of um, maintaining um, coaching monitor is great. And um, to tackle all these obstacles, and many methods have been proposed, but still in most cases, it still require a temperature controlled um, coaching of uh, normally two to eight Celsius degree for vaccine transportation. Therefore, um, the cold chain infrastructure upgrades and temperature monitor regulations are still important and need to be improved um, for the overall cold chain development. And to tackle all these problems, understanding how new technologies and innovations affect um, the uh, cold chain development is also really important. So moving on to the next session of my presentation today, which is some of the uh, innovations uh, in vaccine cold chain cooling systems and monitor systems in the past five years. So the methodology, basically a literature review is done on the um, topic of studies on the topic of um, vaccine cold chain during the last five years. And um, notice here that the studies about vaccine formulations are not 
within the scope of this study and are therefore excluded in this research. So um, studies about um, vaccine drying or solvent flu vaccines or temperature or heat simulations are not included in this study. And um, to define an innovation here, it basically refers to a new method or technology or technique uh, with um, promising uh, preliminary testing results and potential applications uh, in the vaccine cold chain. So um, here are the summary of some of the major foundings uh, about the cold chain cooling systems. So we can see that most uh, research attention has been drawn to this field of um, passive uh, cold storage systems. Um, these innovative passive cooling uh, packagings increase the number of um, possible alternatives for the packaging or containers used in the vaccine cold chain. And these innovative uh, passive cooling systems have uh, pros of low cost and low energy usage compared to traditionally powered refrigerators. Um, also, it is easy to be carried uh, suitable for vaccine distribution, uh, especially in rural areas where uh, the power uh, lacks and the choices of transportation are often limited. And these kind of devices are sometimes really useful uh, because in some regions, public health resources are often limited uh, leading to difficulties uh, maintaining the coaching conditions and uh, the unreliable electric power and poor roads often hinder the installation of um, certain coaching equipment. Um, that is when these passive um, code boxes become really useful. So um, here's a little bit background information about the uh, PCM. Uh, PCM is basically this new uh, trending uh, passive cooling materials uh, receiving great research attentions um, today in the domain of uh, cold chain transportation. So PC P PCM is basically a material that actively, actively absorb, store, and release heat and energy to, uh, to maintain a particular temperature range depending on their uh, specific phase change temperatures. Um, so on the left, on the left uh, of the slides, there are some examples of the PCM um, that can be used in coat boxes uh, for vaccine transportation. Um, PCM is used often um, combining with some other insulation materials such as polyethylene or, polyster or polystyrene. Um, the cold storage boxes or incubators are often used um, in air transport during uh, emergencies or in remote outreach due to their uh, flexible attributes compared to other conventional active cooling devices. So here are some examples of the vaccine cold boxes, which um, there is um, a, a one uh, cold storage equipment, uh, which is made of um, polyethylene. And from the very outside, um, and from the inside, there is this new uh, PCM based uh, cold uh, box, which is found to have um, good temperature and maintain behavior from the inside, as we can see um, from this heat transfer image. And another study uh, below on the second row um, compare the configuration or um, the stacking of the different insulation materials and uh, see if it has any impact on the overall performance of the um, code boxes. And it turned out it does. And the configuration of the materials um, does matter for its overall cooling behaviors. So besides the use of um, PCM, here are several um, locally made passive uh, cooling devices. And um, one of them uh, called uh, Depot Clay has a cost of only $11 per unit and showing great temperature maintains behavior. And um, a few tests um, have indicated that this device can maintain uh, below 26 plus degree and the low cost and easy manufacture makes it a good promising 
alternative passive cooling packaging uh, choice uh, for the vaccine cooking. And uh, besides all these kind of materials, uh, more suitable uh, materials are to be explored. And there are in all dimensions, um, like technically, economically, and environmentally, should be further assessed. You have five minutes more. Um, Dr. Lin, you have five oh, minutes more. Right. Five minutes more. Okay, please. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So again, there are some of the um, new method or techniques about the vaccine uh, temperature monitor or quality detection. For example, here is this new temperature indicating materials suitable for vaccine coaching. And other examples include uh, the remote temperature monitor devices and the self-powered uh, sensor monitor uh, devices. And it is also found that a rigid monitoring will actually lead to more uh, temperature execution events because more adverse events are discovered by the rigid monitoring. Um, so if you can recall from uh, my previous slide, uh, freezing is still an ongoing issue during the transportation or storage of the vaccines, especially for aluminum adjuvanted vaccines, which are really freeze sensitive and require attentive um, cold chain adherence. And, um, and there is this new uh, freeze de detection method using the uh, water proton uh, nuclear magnetic uh, resonance or the NMR, uh, which is um, non-destructive and kind of uh, perfect for vaccine quality uh, detection compared with the uh, traditional WHO shake test. Um, and also, it is also found that variation does exist within a bunch of uh, vaccines. And also, uh, not all temperature execution events uh, lead to actual um, damages to the vaccines. So to conclude, we basically had um, uh, an overview at the recent um, innovative techniques in the field of uh, vaccine transportation and storage. For example, um, there's uh, this new passive cooling devices and PCM is one popular material choice. And um, uh, it is also noticeable that um, the configuration, um, like how the materials are stacked together can have an impact on the overall temperature maintained behavior during a cold chain. And also um, the new non-destructive water proton or uh, NMR quality detection method can be a good alternative uh, method uh, to the WHO shake test. And all these innovations uh, is gonna, uh, are gonna affect the way how uh, coaching works and develop to a great extent. So basically that's all I have for my presentation today. Again, thank you very much for having me here today. And I'd like to open the floor for any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ren. A good presentation. I have a one question for you. The use of dry ice, yeah. the use of dry mm -hmm. ice is a good substitute. Can it be used dry ice for the for the cooling purpose? I'm sorry, can you repeat your question, please? Can dry ice dry ice can be used for the cooling purpose? Dry ice mm -hmm. can be used for the oh, cooling. Uh, yep. Right. Yeah. So yeah. So um, I think um, drying ice uh, can be used as like a cooling medium um, in the passive cooling boxes for some of the uh, vaccine transportation, and um, it is a good substitute for um, um, some traditionally uh, cooling medium like the. Uh, liquid nitrogen. Um, so, yeah, I hope that answered your question. Okay, thank you. So nice of you. Thank you, Ren. I yeah, hand over. To, okay, thank you. So nice. I hand over to the next uh, panelist.
Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Heba Talal Mesmeri, Vice Dean for Education Affairs and an Assistant Professor in Logistics and Supply Chain Management at the College of International Transport and Logistics, Arab Academy for Science, Technology, and Maritime Transport. It gives me a pleasure to be here today to moderate this session. And I would like to thank very much the organizing committee for providing me such an opportunity. I would like also to welcome uh, all of you here in the session, which is entitled Logistics, Aviation and Transportation in Digital Age. In this session, we have three papers to be presented, and I believe that they will be highlighting the recent issues that are related to logistics, supply chain, transportation, and international trade, especially during the current pandemic of coronavirus or COVID-19. Before starting with the first presentation, uh, please, for all the presenters, they are kindly requested to make sure that the mics are muted throughout the session, except during uh, each one presentation's time. Also, uh, we have uh, 15 minutes only for each presentation, so please try to manage your time. And if you, you exceeded the time, I will let you know so you can wrap up your presentation uh, in a couple of minutes more at maximum. For the participants or the attendees, in case you have any questions uh, for the presenter, please write it down in the Q&A tab. Uh, so we can have five minutes at the end of each presentation dedicated for uh, discussion and questions. Now we can start with the first paper in this session. The paper uh, has a title of Investigating the Impact of COVID-19 on the Logistics Sector, a case study on Egypt. The paper will be presented by Ms. Jailan Atif. Ms. Jailan is um, a master's degree student in logistics and supply chain management at the Arab Institute for Trade and Commodity Exchange. Uh, she's a graduate teaching assistant at the College of International Transport and Logistics. Arab Academy for Science, Technology, and Maritime Transport. Ms. Jarlan, you have 15 minutes for the presentation and the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Okay, is the screen is relevant? Um, hello, everyone. It's a pleasure publishing uh, our paper in Business and Entrepreneurship uh, International Conference. Today, me, Jalan Atif, and uh, my co authors, Dr. Sara Al Ghazor and uh, Inja Osman, are going to present our paper uh, about um, the investigating the impact of COVID 19 on the logistics sector in Egypt. First, the presentation will start by giving a brief introduction. Uh, about COVID-19 and its influences on logistics and business in general, then showing the intent of our research, moving on to the impact of COVID-19 on the Egyptian economy and logistics activities from previous studies, then the methodology used and its finding and recommended solutions. Well, to begin with, COVID-19 <coughs> COVID had changed the world dramatically. It began in China and then escalated to the whole world. To minimize its impact, all countries implemented public health measures such as curfews and social distancing. From business perspectives, trade and profits have declined. So our intent is to investigate the, COVID, the, the impact of COVID-19 on the sector in Egypt to impose some solutions and recommendations. For instance, manuf uh, manufacturing industry and percent export, transportation, freight forwarding, housing, and the economic situation of the country. From the, um, from the economic perspective, the whole world economy is negatively influenced because of the globalization era that we are living in. Restrictions and lockdown, lockdowns cause global trade deficits, inflation, and uh, unemployment. While in Egypt, purchasing manager index declined to the lowest level, unemployment rate decreased to, to 9.7 from 7.7. .7. Tourism is affected badly. Swiss Canada revenues also declined, and then the Egyptian import and export declined too. <clears throat> the value of Egyptian bond declined again compared to Euro and US dollars. Um, well, regarding the logistics activity and the supply chain, COVID 19 affects the whole supply chain, starting from suppliers and all retailers faced inventory shortage, for example, in fish and masks. 
In addition to the transportation sector is affected, like for example, the transport shipments volume reduced and the cost also increased. Moreover, trade restrictions affected all transport routes and networks. So as a result, all distribution plans negatively affected, which led, uh, led to severe losses. Moving to the methodology, the research method is based on secondary data from previous studies and primary data for, uh, from conducting the semi-structured interviews with six Egyptian operators in logistics and supply chain fields, such, such as the embers and the export managers and marketing managers in Alexandria cargo, cargo handling company, production and warehouse operators at the Al diaries, to get more accurate data about the Egyptian economy and its logistics activities separately. The aim of these interviews is to highlight the barriers faced by Egypt to overcome the pandem uh, this pandemic and suggest solutions to it. So first, the uh, Egyptian economy before COVID-19 was facing inflation and more investment due to the political changes. But after the pandemic, the Egyptian bound depreciated companies start to minimize employees, salaries and fire them off and all Egyptian investment declined. <clears throat> Moving on to uh, transportation, lockdowns affect cargo volume transport, uh, transported to and from Egypt. There are a lot of maritime routes to cancel its trips. For example, Port of Alexandria accepted discharge of vessels only, and Port of Damia restricted, restricted its operations. And, and then moving to the warehouse distribution and inventory management, there are a lot of uh, shortage faced by Egyptian operators, such as in medical supplements. Also, many retailers and operators shift to online shopping using protection systems for customer orders and so on to compete in the market. Uh, regarding the Egyptian imports and the exports, due to lockdowns, all imports and exports uh, declined because Egypt depend on Chinese products to a very great extent. Uh, coming to the challenges and barriers faced Egypt during the COVID-19 pandemic, Egypt has a, leak, uh, a lack of safety commitment culture, and Egyptians don't commit to following the public health instructions such as wearing masks. Government policies have started to impose penalties on people who don't follow the safety measures, uh, and most Egyptian companies use a reactive approach. They lack risk management strategies and they don't think about uh, con uh, contingency plans. Egyptian companies depend on initial activities such as using a lot of documentation processes and a lot of employees to make one process uh, uh, done without any sort of using technology or game practices. Um, <clears throat> least, but uh, to overcome uh, the coronavirus barriers in logistics, uh, in logistics uh, sector in Egypt. To overcome COVID-19, uh, the Egyptian government have to put the rules and regulations to raise awareness about hygiene measures and precautions. And Egyptian organizations have to, go, to follow proactive approaches by setting plans for emergency crisis situations. To know the country's capabilities and resources to, to depend more on their legal pro products rather than exporting. Monitoring the competitive global market, markets to be well known with the new technologies and innovations. Moving on to the roadmap, based on the conducted interviews, we have found some obstacles and recommended for it some applicable so solutions for it. So the first obstacle is the lack of digitalization. So it can be solved using virtual, uh, virtual transactions rather than the physical ones, and they depend more on a secure databases supporting the blockchain and making upgrades in the internet of things, um, apply artificial intelligence, especially in warehouses, robotics, and inventory, and uh, the sustainable green practices. The second obstacle is the lack of safety measures precaution. 
So uh, uh, enterprises and business have to increase employees' awareness for virus symptoms, merge employees' schedule to apply social distance and avoid the crowd, replace signatures with confirmation emails and more efforts to maintain hygiene in workplaces and transport modes, increase the spending on medical supplies for workers and improve clean and sanitizing environment. Third, the obstacle uh, we found is the uh, low productivity and efficiency. So we have to develop managerial skills, maintain cash flow management and adjust cont uh, quality control management. And of course, the less rely on uh, import industrial materials. Then uh, the trade restrictions and supply uh, disruptions obstacle, which uh, will be solved uh, by shifting uh, demand to the local market and producing products, uh, which is good substitute and focus on supporting small producers, lowering, lowering consumer consumption and secure labor safety to maintain their workforce, restructuring firm operations and collaborations between private sectors and the policymakers in Egypt. A uh, last um, obstacle is an effective strategy for disasters in the long run, which um, need the uh, stakeholders to continuous monitoring on the planning succession, opening new markets and chances to investors accelerating acquisition of the Internet of Things, and strengthen country digital infrastructure to engage workers to be motivated during these hard times. So in conclusion, COVID-19 affects the whole world negatively, but, but in Egypt, in order to overcome this pandemic, Egyptian operators and stakeholders have to strengthen uh, their business efficiency and make contingency plans to, to avoid this sudden risk and to follow the active approaches to gain competitive advantage. Thank you for attention. And if you have any questions, let's just start. Thank you very much, Ms. Dralain, for your presentation. Actually, the paper gave an overview about the impact of COVID-19 on the various logistics activities um, in different sectors in Egypt. Um, I see here a question. You mentioned that to overcome the negative effects of COVID-19, Egypt should pay uh, should apply some sort of technology such uh, as IoT. Do you think is it applicable in Egypt? I, I think in Egypt, almost all managers look at the short-term results. So it's applicable, yes, but uh, in the short term, they will invest a lot to, to apply such technology. But in the long run, it would be more beneficial to reduce the human interactions. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have another question. As you conducted an interview with the uh, dairy products company, how they dealt with the warehousing operations to their fresh and dairy products? Uh, the company, they, they don't st uh, store, uh, they don't have warehousing because all their products are fresh. They store fresh, fresh products. Uh, so it will expire such as yogurt and milk. So they have, uh, production plan to produce the products uh, day by day or maximum three days. As they don't have shelf, uh, shelf of products. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Dailan. I think we have no more questions. Uh, so now we can move to the next presentation. Uh, the thank, second, you. thank you. The second paper is entitled Impacts of uh, COVID-19 on Developing Countries comparative study on foreign trade between China and Egypt. The paper will be presented by Mr. Hussein Magdi. He is a PhD candidate at the University of Minho, Portugal. He is currently working as a teaching assistant at the College of International Transport and Logistics, Arab Academy for Science, Technology, and Maritime Transport. Mr. Hussein, you have 15 minutes for the presentation and you have the floor now. Thank you for your time. And um, uh, this paper will uh, show the impact of COVID-19 on developing countries through a comparative study on foreign trade between China and Egypt. 
This presentation agenda will highlight the introduction, importance of the study, literature review, methodology, main findings, and further researchers. Uh, starting with the introduction, since the beginning of 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic has affected almost every aspect of economic life and individuals worldwide. The, the pandemic effect affected all countries in different sectors, especially the economic and transportation sectors. Dealing with epidemics requires a rapid response from countries to control and minimize risks, which is reflected in supply chains, logistics and freight and commercial commodities movements, whose primary goal is to respond to the growing and un uh, unexpected market demands. Thus, freight movement was under a tremendous pressure as well as health and medical supplies used to cope with such pandemic. The mentioned drawbacks have also affected the maritime and air transport freight industries negatively and led to demobilizations of labor, shortage and or preventation of freight and commercial commodities throughout or from and to countries. Also, restrictions set by governments to avoid or minimize the spread of the virus through seaports in addition to bans has also imposed by different countries on the entry of containers or cargo and vessels that are being operated between different international uh, ports, especially, uh, especially uh, ZOLT. Sorry. Uh, those are transported from and to China. This study will precisely discuss the impact of COVID-19 on foreign trade through a comparative study between China and Egypt. This is because the sad pandemic has led to a sharp decrease in the movement of commodities through transportation sectors in maritime and air transport. The importance of the study, the epidemic has also spread quickly in the world and negatively affected many sectors, as said before, uh, the economic and transportation sectors, which led to the collapse of the economy and trade of some countries, or, may, or the, major, uh, the majority of countries. To compare the current situations with the past uh, after the impacts of this uh, epidemic. Uh, we con uh, through we concluded uh, or highlighted uh, from the previous studies um, the main findings uh, uh, of the effect of COVID-19 and its impact on uh, logistics industry, transportation, global shipping, and what is expected after uh, this uh, epidemic uh, when it's finished. Um, some studies have uh, highlighted the impact of coronavirus on shipping industries uh, and uh, these studies highlighted that it causes many losses in freight transportation, uh, which some countries cannot deal with this. Uh, also, uh, others uh, uh, have highlighted or mentioned uh, the entities uh, in supply chain that impressed by the virus. Um, also, other papers have uh, studied the role of international air transport in the spreading of COVID-19. And by the way, the air freight or air transportation of passengers is considered as uh, from the main reasons or major reasons that helps in spreading the, uh, the virus throughout many countries. And others uh, have uh, highlighted that after uh, this uh, pandemic, uh, the freight rate will increase and uh, there will be other restrictions from many countries concerning uh, the health of, uh, uh, of, uh, of transporting cargo or passengers. The methodology used, the study uh, discusses the effect of coronavirus on the export and imports of countries, as Egypt was chosen as one of the largest developing country, African countries that depend most of its imports on Chinese products and vice versa. The second country is China, 
uh, was uh, chosen as the largest Asian country, uh, exporting many of its products uh, to Egypt and other countries, which the economy of most countries depends on Chinese products. This paper also you, uh, used or applied a mixed approach uh, by using qualitative and quantitative data. The quantitative data were collected using the cross-sectional survey developed by the International Transport Service Division of the Chamber of Commerce. With regard to China, the survey has already been conducted and the findings were published. For Egypt, authors used the same survey published uh, from the International Transport Service Division uh, and uh, applied uh, uh, and uh, uh, and applied it uh, and collected data from selected uh, responses uh, from the Egyptian imports and export sector, and the results were largely similar. The qualitative data in Egypt were collected through conducting semi-structured interviews with the academic and the industry experts in maritime and the air transportation sectors through do, uh, Zoom meetings and telephones. The reason uh, behind this, uh, uh, due to uh, the limitations uh, and uh, uh, of the published uh, uh, documents uh, and the articles about uh, data related to Egypt, and due to the restrictions of the pandemic. Whereas the qualitative uh, data for China were gathered from rich and extensive literature, such as research journal articles, conference papers, and local and international reports. For the findings, as you see in the following graph, Egypt exports and imports have fluctuated during the second quarter of 2020 for the exports have shown a sudden decline as well as imports till May 2020. At the beginning of June 2020, Egyptian imports increased by 5,600 million dollars besides exports have also increased. On the other hand, the Chinese imports have gradually increased at the end of the second quarter till the end of 2020, and the Chinese exports have quickly recovered by the end of February 2020. This is due to the early isolation and confluence of people. The country succeeded to recover and return to normal life. After analyzing the results of the uh, survey and interviews, which were co conducted with Egyptian industry experts, as said before, several effects were identified as follows. The negative impact of uh, the pandemic on work process and companies, the negative impact of COVID-19 on air and maritime transportation, the pandemic has caused many logistical problems, such as increasing the freight rate and uh, economic fluctuations. And we have to highlight that after the pandemic, freight rate might or may increase uh, than now. Uh, and finally, the shortage of commercial commodities flow. This table highlights the main aspects between China and Egypt uh, related or regarding to uh, the reaction to uh, the pandemic for the response to COVID-19 aspect. In China, it was quick and strict. In Egypt, it was moderate. The impact of COVID-19 on the country's economy for China uh, has quickly recovered as shown in the in the findings, and in Egypt, uh, it, the economic impact is fluctuated. It means it's not stable. For the flights during the pandemic, both countries have redu reduced flights, and for the export level, it is relatively declined in China and declined in Egypt. And for imports uh, level in China, it was merely affected, 
and in Egypt it is fluctuated. The study has shown the differences between China and Egypt in dealing with crises and emergencies, which guarantees during the first periods of crisis outbreaks, besides highlighting the governmental role in dealing with crisis and the way for countries to improve living standards in the future, the way that they are guarantee of a better future for, of, for the region. Moreover, this study has shown the effect of the pandemic on the transportation sectors in both countries, which includes air and maritime transportation. Furthermore, this research paper has illustrated clearly the fluctuations of the mentioned pandemic on the imported and exported commodities during the lockdown periods till the end of December 2020 through the findings of this study using the mixed approach, uh, which have a negative impact on local producers, commodities, and freight movement as well. As well. For further researchers and uh, the limitations of this study, uh, it is recommended to investigate the drivers and, bar and barriers of the pandemic on road transportation in developed and developing countries, in addition to investigate freight transportation through land, sea, and airports, taking in account the safety standards followed globally that eliminates the spread of the pandemic. Moreover, to extend the usage of electronic applications and online communication platforms in the business environment, particularly in the financial transactions to reduce a congestion and the risk of infection. Furthermore, to adopt green transportation to protect the environment against any negative impacts in the near future. Last but not least, to investigate the impact of international agreements related to foreign trade, customers, rule of trade in severely affected countries, and quarantine of goods. And thank you, and waiting for your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Hussein, for the presentation and for your time management. Uh, thank you for the paper, which uh, comprehensively um, compared between Egypt and China in terms of the uh, impact of COVID-19 on foreign trade goods by different means of different uh, statistics. Uh, actually, I don't see any questions uh, received for the presentation, but uh, I do have a question, if you please. Of course. Um, can you illustrate more on the methodology you applied in the research? You mentioned that you conducted interviews. Uh, how many interviews did you conduct? Uh, who uh, were your uh, interviewees? I don't mean names by, uh, of course, uh, I mean the positions, the levels of the interviewees. How did you select your, your interviewees? Um, did you face any problems uh, during the conducting the interviews? Yes, we faced uh, some uh, problems. Some interviews refused to respond to, uh, to our uh, 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 interview, uh, but we collected about a sample of five uh, interviews uh, from industry uh, experts uh, uh, in uh, shipping uh, companies and uh, air uh, transport uh, freight forwarders. Uh, we managed uh, to uh, uh, to interview some uh, of uh, some of them were employees and some of them were uh, CEOs, but it was very difficult. Uh, some interview uh, interview uh, interviewees um, like have some concerns about uh, the data. Uh, however, we mentioned that these were uh, will be confidential, but we faced uh, some uh, restrictions. Thank you very much, Mr. Hussein. And uh, now we can move to the last presentation in this session. Our last paper is titled A Current Issues and Emerging Trends in Logistics and Supply Chain Management in Naumen. The presenter is Mr. Benson Rusev. He is a PhD student at uh, uh, South African University. He is currently a lecturer in the Department of uh, Business and Economics at the Modern College of Business Science. He's also a supply chain management expert who, uh, with over uh, 25 years of experience in both the private and the public sectors. 
So let's welcome Mr. Benson. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you, Doctor. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to thank my employer, uh, Modern College of uh, Business uh, and Sciences, as well as uh, Arabic Academy for Science, Technology and Maritime Transport in, e in Egypt for um, arranging this wonderful and exciting uh, conference. I also want to take this opportunity to thank uh, the uh, participants and previous presenters from which I have also uh, taken some notes. Uh, yesterday, I got something from uh, Professor Dr. Patrick Bennett, where he was talking about uh, strategy versus agility, which is part of what I'm going to uh, talk about. It is my humble submission uh, to present to you uh, today our paper, which is entitled The Current Issues and Emerging Trends in Logistics and Supply Chain Management in Omani. Uh, this paper, I'm presenting it with uh, Professor Hesham Magdi, uh, and I also take this opportunity to once again thank him for his, uh, contrib his immense contribution towards the, the success of the, the paper. The structure of my presentation is going to start with the introduction, then I move on to literature review, the methodology, the limitations that we faced, then the findings, and then the recommendations. Um, supply chain is something that has been uh, uh, said a lot uh, because companies, they've seen that they need to use it as one of the strategies why? Because companies, they are living in an environment that is ever-changing, that is a dynamic. So in order to survive uh, operational as well as improvement strategies, they need to be adopted. And one of them is to recognize that supply chain is important for the survival of any uh, organization. So this, uh, the harnessing of supply chain now uh, it has to also assisted the companies in uh, performing well. Now, our study, uh, we sought to explore uh, the trends in logistics and supply chain, which uh, uh, can enable companies in order to, uh, to achieve uh, their successes. Uh, our literature, we sought literature uh, and uh, the first definition that I'm going to give about supply chain is that it talks about uh, seamless value added processes across organizational boundaries to meet the real needs of the end uh, customer. So from there we can uh, draw or we can see that the, the chain must be seamless in, in, in that organizations now they, don't, they no longer have to think individually. The silo mentality must, must be removed from thinking of organizations uh, in order to add value to whatever they are uh, doing. And as well as the focus now is on getting or producing something that is required by the customer rather than uh, the, the demand, uh, the, the push, demand approach where companies would just produce something and then just push it to customers. This one is a pull approach. You have to feel what the customer wants and then you produce what they really want. Uh, then the- Mr. Second, Benson, uh, excuse me. Yes, talk. Do you have a PowerPoint presentation to be shared or no? Sorry? Do you have a PowerPoint oh, sorry, presentation sorry, yes. to be shared? Oh, sorry, I didn't share it. Oh, you are not sharing your sorry, screen. Sorry, sorry for that. Sorry, sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, sorry, sorry for that. Oh, no problem. <laughs> okay.
Right, sorry, yes, thank you, thank you for the correction. Can you see it now? Yes, yes, it's clear. Okay, let me, let Please me put, uh, it. put it in yes. the slide room. Yes. yes, okay. Yes, thank yes. you. Okay, so yes, yes, this was the structure. This is the structure of my presentation, the introduction, literature review, methodology, and then the limitations there. And then and now I was here talking about the definitions that we came across about supply chain, where it talks about seamless uh, value added activities in order to meet the customer's needs. And then another one from uh, Procter and Gamble in 1997, where they said identification and elimination of wasteful practices. So that is essential in, um, in supply chain in order to achieve. And then the definition of uh, uh, logistics itself was also given by the Council of uh, Logistics uh, as way back as 1988. And this, you would find that what we were coming across, the definitions, they've not very much um, uh, changed. Uh, only the difference, what people maybe need to understand is uh, what is the difference between supply chain and logistics. Rather, logistics is a, 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 a component of supply chain, uh, just as good as when we talk of procurement. So it's part of uh, supply chain, but we then maybe have to go deeper and just look at it. So the literature that we came across, we found out that, uh, for instance, uh, uh, the supply chain talks about drivers what is it that makes supply chain kicks? Basically, there are six drivers there, the facilities, the inventory, transportation, information, uh, procurement and pricing. And when you look at uh, facilities, you are, used, you are simply looking at where are you producing and what are the warehouses that are required, for instance, when you are moving, then the inventory is what you are really dealing in, the, whether the raw materials or finished products then the transportation is what mode of transport do you really need to move a particular uh, product? Then the information, where do you, it answers where you find the, uh, including, it cuts across because it answers where you find facilities, the inventory, and even the kind of transport that you need. Uh, then the procurement, and finally the, the pricing, which again includes the, the negotiations as to how much you are prepared uh, to buy from, um, from your suppliers. Then the practice is there, there is collaboration, supply chain uh, and demand planning. These are very critical because you need to know where you are getting your raw materials. And you also need to know the other side, the demand part of who is demanding this because otherwise if you don't do that, you buy uh, raw materials and you then produce something that is not going to be bought in the market. You need also the, uh, to plan the production processes and then the logistics also comes in, which is the timely related positioning of resources. Then, uh, like what uh, one previous uh, presenter or a keynote speaker said, performance is very important because if something cannot be measured, then the, that is the way we, we, we lose it. So performance there in supply chains, we have seen the quality, the cost management, uh, timeliness of deliveries, um, the quantity as well as the compliance. Some of the literature that we came up across, especially when it comes to performance there, was giving insights to the total cost in supply chain, the, the cash cycle time, which now measures what you as an organization are offering your, your your, your data, as well as what your suppliers are offering you in terms of number of days to, to pay, such that when you find you are giving more days to your data to pay and less that you are getting from your suppliers, it means you are in a, a very critical cash flow problem. Then they also, these supply chains, they also have to measure such things like delivery performance, uh, the average orders that we feel as in supply chain, and then even the e-business performance. And these uh, measures can then also be put even into index where you can maybe have uh, index of one to five, one being weak, five being uh, the best or an excellent performance measure or sometimes one uh, and, and uh, to three. Again, that would be measurement that can be used then in 
partnerships there in uh, supply chain is one of the um, things that uh, are being practiced there. It also take, uh, takes um, about three dimensions there where we have maybe cooperation, coordination and collaboration. For cooperation that is done for short term horizons and that could be just a single or a functional area that is doing that. Then collaboration would find that is over a long term uh, period of the organization and then that helps the firms there in terms of the extension and uh, seeing that they are not just dealing or doing business as themselves, but they have to extend it to externals as well. Then uh, another discovery was about the maturity of uh, supply chain, but that starts from the maturity of the supply chain department being recognized within the organization, wherein uh, the contributors that we got were REC and LONG, uh, with four passive, independent, supportive, and the integrative. And then uh, the later one was uh, McCormack and uh, Lok May in 2004, where they defined the ad hoc approach, defined, linked, and integrated, and then the extended. Wherein, when you come to the extended now, you find that level of maturity is including others outside. And after that, you also need the key success factors. What is it max, makes the uh, supply chain succeed? You need to put that as a dashboard and the things that you saw are cost efficiency, quality, responsiveness. How much are you responsive to the needs of the customer? Flexibility, agility, and then obviously whatever you need, you must manage that. You have information and you must be able to manage that. Who do you give your information uh, when you are in supply chain? in what form of information are you giving them? So that is important. So th th this is very important in supply chain in, in order to uh, achieve it. Our methodology was a, a systematic literature review and we used uh, search engines such as uh, Google Advance and Masada, Masada, Masada being um, uh, a popular um, uh, in, in Oman, it's used for uh, at the higher institutions of learning and research. So it's based in Oman. And then we targeted peer reviewed journals only the uh, books and uh, book chapters. We, we left them because we were using uh, the, the internet to do our literature review. So, and then we also limited our time search period from uh, 2010 to 2020. And uh, we also targeted only journals which were written in English not in order to avoid the translation. Then the keywords that we used were supply chain, supply chain performance, supply chain drivers, maturity and supply chain practices. Then from that, we do a conceptual framework that we came up with wherein we said then supply chain maturity levels uh, plus supply chain drivers uh, plus supply chain practices, they lead to uh, supply chain performance as well as uh, leading to organizational uh, performance. Our limitations in our start were based on the current uh, development in terms of COVID-19. We could not access uh, participants uh, because for instance, uh, the number of uh, workers who are going to work currently you find government has got regulations in order to keep, uh, to keep COVID-19 to say uh, only about 30% of staff can go to work. That's now limited because th there is no guarantee that the 30% who are going to work um, uh, are knowledgeable about supply chains. It's a mixture of uh, people from different departments. Then also, they, we also faced the uh, limitation in terms of literature there about what uh, has been done about this uh, subject area in Oman and as well as the, the time limit and finding uh, funding. Those were our limitations there. Then uh, our uh, preliminary uh, literature shows that uh, the, the relationship, uh, responsiveness, re integration, performance, these are very important in terms of supply chain in order to uh, receive, I mean, to respond and to 
actually give what we want to the to the customers and then the level of maturity also has been highlighted as something that is important in in uh, logistics there uh, in order to in order to add to the supply chain then the drivers uh, they have always been coming as six transportation facilities inventory information uh, procurement and the pricing uh, we therefore uh, recommend that uh, organizations they need to uh, to understand that uh, supply chains they uh, have to be looked at from three basic areas that is the level of uh, maturity the drivers that makes the supply chain uh, tick we even he called these drivers enablers because they facilitate the operation of the supply chain. And then the practices, what are the pra practices that are uh, taking place, especially collaboration, where you look at the key activities that an organization is doing. And then you say, let's work together with even outsiders, our suppliers, as well as even our, our distributors up until the product gets to the final. And then finally, we also recommend some, um, some benchmark of performances amongst uh, organizations. And uh, since this was also only literature review, we recommend uh, empirical studies to be carried out in this area. I take this opportunity to thank you for your time and your listening. Uh, any questions? Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. Benson, for this uh, presentation. Uh, actually, the paper suggested a conceptual framework uh, that integrates supply chain uh, drivers, maturity level and practices, and how they could lead to uh, supply chain performance. Uh, I do have a question for you, if you please. Uh, how do you see uh, the impact of uh, COVID-19 on the applicability of the proposed model itself, especially in Oman? Yes, what, what then we... We, because COVID-19 has caused a lot of um, challenges, but through the integration now where we say we have to think not as a silo organizations or even supply chains, because these days it's no more organizations that are, are competing, but it's supply chains. So we need to, and these supply chains, they are no longer straight as they used to be, but they are like webs. So we need then to make sure that partners the, the information, so information dissemination is important. What is it that has happened today? L remember, uh, two, uh, uh, a week, uh, two weeks ago, we had this incident of the evergreen, um, ever given, sorry, the ever given uh, getting stuck in the Suez Canal. So once somebody has come across that information, it's vital to relay that information to all the partners in the supply chain, and that makes we, we then have also to be flexible as supply chain partners. So that's how, what I believe we can do. Thank you very much, Mr. Benson. I think we have no more questions or comments from the attendees. Thank you very much for your presentation. Okay, and by, you. This, you, by this, we came to the end of our session. I hope it was interesting. Thanks for all the presenters for their uh, valuable contribution and thanks for all the attendees for joining the session. Thank you all.